investment growth, I believe, was 2005. Uh, 2005 and 6, uh, we reported 1.6, 1. Point, sorry, 2004 and 5, we reported 1.7 and 1.6 percent assessment growth. So again, the highest level of assessment growth in over a decade. Uh, and I will take you through some additional slides in terms of where we are realizing that assessment growth. So again, the assessment growth uh, is very much aligned to the record building permits. Uh, I believe this is now our fifth consecutive year of achieving more than a billion dollars in uh, building permit revenues. Uh, and again, so what you're seeing is a a alignment in terms of the assessment growth to uh, the building permit activity. So 1.6%, what does that represent in terms of tax revenue? It represents $13.1 million in tax revenue. And how do we apply the $13.1 million? We apply it to reduce the, the levy. So it's provided as a means of mitigating the tax impact for all property owners and residents in the city of Hamilton. So the 13.1% if I or 13.1 million dollars you'll see the breakdown of the 13.1 million across classes you'll see residential represents about 10 million of that 13.1 million and you'll see in a later slide residential accounts for in terms of the total unweighted assessment residential accounts for about 88% of our total unweighted assessment. So again, it's, it's something that we need to be very conscious of in terms of our policies as to how we want to affect development and the nature of development that we want to affect. But I'll expand on that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of commercial, you're seeing some positive uh, changes, 2% in commercial, uh, and that represents approximately $2.7 million in additional uh, tax revenue. Industrial 1.1% or approximately $464,000. Now if you break down the 1.6%, you'll see that residential again, 88% of that. So 1.3% of the 1.6 is related to residential assessment growth. Uh, commercial contributing approximately 0.3 and industrial 0.1. And so you'll notice some rounding there. Uh, in terms of the 1.6, but that provides a breakdown. 88% of that 1.6% is residential, and that leaves the balance of about 12% non-residential. And then if you look uh, in terms of a further breakdown in terms of that uh, assessment growth by ward, and again, this is uh, reported in agenda item 5.1, You'll see this information in the staff report as it relates to assessment growth. So I'll point to a, uh, a few wards or areas where we're seeing, continuing to see the assessment growth in terms of the concentration of, of growth. So again, this is total uh, unweighted assessment and uh, total unweighted, oops. If I can go back, you'll see the total unweighted assessment, just over a billion dollars increase in unweighted assessment. And, and in terms of uh, municipal taxes, you'll see again, the reference to the $13.1 million. And you'll see that we've broken it down, the total tax benefits by ward. And you'll see that in terms of where we're seeing that concentration of uh, higher density of assessment growth at Ward 7, Wards 9, Wards 11, 12, and 15. Also in terms of uh, what that assessment growth translates into in terms of the change per ward. So again, this column represents what that assessment growth represents as a total change within the ward. So if, just to illustrate, so you'll see the range again in Ward 1. The assessment growth was 0.1% and the high was in Ward 11 where the assessment growth was a change of 4.8% within that ward specifically. So again, if we just look at Ward 11, that assessment growth of 200, just short of $296.5 million represents a 4.9% or 4.8% in assessment growth in that ward. And so again, you're seeing Wards 15, uh, wards 12, 11, uh, 9, 
and seven, reporting higher concentrations in terms of assessment growth. Thank you. So I was going to, I mentioned earlier that I was going to have a ribbon with me just to hand down to uh, Ward 11 in terms of our assessment growth. So again, it, uh, you'll see the breakdown of the 1.6%. Uh, and then in terms of the total change as to uh, how that 1.6% is comprised by the various wards, we've broken that down as well. So out of that 1.6%, Ward 15 is contributing 0.2, Ward 12 is contributing 0.3, and Ward 11.4, and then you'll see the breakdown of the other wards as to how they are contributing to that total of 1.6%. Uh, again, we have some additional information that committees asked us for in terms of the trending of 2011 to 15, and how the uh, development that we've realized over that period, where it's being concentrated or realized across the city. So in terms of, uh, I mentioned previously, the split between residential and non-residential. Uh, so again, you'll see out of the 1.6%, residential makes up 1.3 of that, or 88%, and uh, non-residential makes up the difference of 0.3% for the total of 1.6. So in terms of unweighted, uh, again, our ratio remains relatively unchanged, you'll recall that Chris mentioned, I believe, last week in terms of our ratio of uh, uh, unweighted assessment, res, non-res, we've been reporting 87.13. This year has us moving slightly in the direction we don't want to be moving into in terms of a higher reliance on residential. Uh, and what I want to point out is while we're reporting on the unweighted assessment because of tax ratios, that unweighted assessment has a, uh, in terms of impact on property taxes, has a impact uh, in terms of the distribution of a higher reliance on non-res because our non-res tax ratios are higher than residential. So just to, I'm going to skip ahead and explain that. So in terms of residential, you'll recall our tax ratio is 1. And in commercial, it's 1.98 and industrial, it's 3.12. Uh, so for every million dollars in residential assessment, the city of Hamilton realizes approximately $12,000 in municipal tax revenue. For every million dollars in commercial, we realize approximately 23,500 in commercial uh, municipal property taxes. So again, you'll see that is about two, per two times the residential which comes back to our tax ratios. Again, commercial, we apply a tax ratio of 1.98. So again, for every million dollars in commercial uh, assessment, unweighted assessment, the city benefits about two times the equivalent of residential. And then finally, in terms of industrial, again, just a reminder, our tax ratio is approximately 3.12. So every million dollars in industrial assessment we benefit to the tune of approximately 37,000 in municipal taxes. So why I wanted to highlight this is we've reported previously in terms of our comparators as it relates to the ratio of res to non-res, we're below our comparator average. Our comparator average is reporting non-residential weighted assessment approximately 17%. And we are somewhere in the area of 13%. This year, we slipped slightly, 88% res, 12% non-residential. So again, as we develop in 2016, our strategic plan, as we look at our incentive programs, we're going to have to examine our incentive programs and, whether, and, and determine whether or not there's alignment in terms of our objectives as it relates to growing our non-residential assessment base. And uh, again, we will have to consider in terms of those incentive programs, whether it's our development charge exemption, our residential loan programs, uh, or again, our, our institutional development charge exemptions, whether or not uh, we need to revise those incentive programs to better affect the rate of growth in our non-residential. So again, uh, I just wanted to highlight in terms 
of 2016, we are seeing some positive uh, uh, reporting as it relates to non-residential. I'll just remind committee, we had negative assessment growth in our non-residential in 2011, 12, and 13. This is now two consecutive years of assessment growth in our non-residential, about 0.3%. So very positive outcome for 2000 and uh, again, sorry, for 2015 leading into 2016. So again, positive, uh, a record uh, assessment growth period in terms of uh, over the last decade. Uh, and we are seeing positive assessment growth in non-residential. However, we're hoping that in future years we're able to affect this ratio and see a higher level of non-residential assessment growth going forward. So in terms of our uh, commercial property classes, again, we're reporting growth of about 0.3%. Uh, it represents about $2.3 million in additional property tax uh, revenues. And uh, we've identified, we've tried to summarize a number of properties uh, that are affecting that, and that's uh, the activation labs, the GoTrain layover facility, and uh, new commercial building shopping plazas in Stony Creek, Flamborough, and Bimbrook. So again, you're seeing that alignment in terms of where we're realizing residential growth to some of the growth in our commercial. Uh, you'll see in uh, a slide that's coming up in terms of where we've trended as it relates to assessment growth is uh, higher than average concentrations in the Glanbrook, Bimbrook area, Ancaster, and Waterdown. And so we're seeing the growth in our commercial sectors that aligns to supporting that residential growth. So again, uh, just identifying that alignment between res and non-res. Uh, we are reporting decreases in uh, commercial assessments, you'll recall, in terms of uh, the vacancies as it relates to those target retail outlets, that's having an effect on our uh, net assessment growth. Uh, TransCanada Pipelines is contributing, and as it relates to McMaster Innovation uh, Centre, McMaster Innovation Centre was classified as a taxable uh, property, and it is now considered exempt. And so we've lost that tax revenue that McMaster Innovation Park uh, was contributing in terms of property tax. In terms of uh, industrial, the industrial property class, uh, again, we're reporting 0.1% uh, growth, which translates into $463,000 in additional property taxes. Uh, and again, in terms of the specific properties, you'll see that uh, increases in the commercial Property class include ArcelorMittal de Fasco, and I believe that's the galvanizing line that we're recognizing in terms of the increased assessment in ArcelorMittal, which is very positive because I believe in 2012 uh, there was a successful assessment appeal as it relates to uh, ArcelorMittal de Fasco. So we're actually realizing some growth again in terms of the uh, assessed value uh, of that property. Um, Triple M Metal, United Step, and uh, Metal Limited, and a new industrial commercial facility in Lancaster contributing to that 0.1% or 463,000. Uh, in terms of some properties where we're, we're uh, seeing some erosion in, in terms of the industrial assessment base includes Metro, uh, Freightliner, Hamilton Inc., and Russell St metals. So again, just a short summary of some of the properties that are affecting the net positive impact of 0.1% in our industrial class. So uh, back on February 1st, committee moved a motion directing staff to prepare a presentation highlighting the historical and graphical trends related to new assessment and supplemental growth and report through the 2016 GIS budget process. So I just want to pause through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, at this time and just thank staff, uh, not only corporate services staff, but planning staff for the work that they've been able to compile in short of three weeks as it relates to this request. So again, I just wanted to recognize the efforts of staff in those two departments. 
You would have seen this uh, heat map. It was part of Jason's presentation, Planning and Active, and it shows 2015 building permit construction value. And so you'll see the uh, concentrations in terms of uh, building permit activity for 2015. Again, another uh, record year in terms of building permit value exceeding the billion dollar mark. And again, you'll see the corridors where there is uh, higher concentrations in building permit activity. And what we've done as it relates to the motion is uh, we've plotted assessment growth for the period 2011 to 15. So this is accumulated assessment growth over that period. Uh, and I'll take you through the scale because I appreciate it's a little difficult to interpret the scale. So in terms of neutral, this shade of green really shows neutrality where there is neither positive assessment growth nor negative assessment growth. As you move across to the deeper greens, blues and purples, that shows a higher concentration of accumulated assessment growth over the period 2011 to 2015. And how it's captured as in the scale as is in thousands of dollars per hectare. If you move to the other side of the scale and you move towards the oranges and reds, that captures negative assessment growth. So a decline in assessment. And so we're seeing a decline in assessment uh, as it relates to, I mentioned previously, 2011-12, our Sir Mattel de Fasco had a successful assessment appeal. Uh, and that is reported under Ward 3 in terms of lost or foregone uh, assessment base and tax revenue. The risk is, as it relates to that specific area, is some uncertainty with some of the other properties in that area. So in the case of U.S. Steel, U.S. Steel contributes approximately $4 million annually in municipal taxes. And if that assessment base continues to erode, that burden then is shifted on to the other assessment classes. And given that residential is outpacing non-residential, that would cause a shift principally onto the residential class. The other pockets where uh, we're reporting a decline in assessment is Lime Ridge Mall. Lime Ridge Mall had a successful assessment appeal, and again, that is the other pocket where you're seeing negative assessment growth. Generally speaking, what you're seeing is assessment growth across the developed area of the city, so a very positive outcome. But again, as I reported in terms of 2015, where you're seeing higher concentrations of assessment growth are in the Glanbrook Benbrook area, the Ancaster area, and the Waterdown area, with some uh, higher concentrations of assessment growth uh, on the mountain as well. So again, consistent with what we've reported each year through the assessment growth figures, consistent with 2015's results, you'll recall Ward 7, 9, 11, 15, uh, and again, what we're seeing in this Trend period of 2011-15, again, the consistent uh, realization of higher concentrations of assessment growth in these three communities and, uh, uh, sorry, and on the mountain as well. Now, what we're hoping to see in future years is that the building activity in the downtown area will contribute uh, to future assessment growth. Uh, however, there's a few risks, and I'm going to get to one of my last slides. I'll speak to the risks as it relates to the forms of development that we're realizing in the downtown area as it relates to property tax revenues. So again, uh, another graphic that staff prepared again is just an average across the board. And again, the deeper greens show a higher concentration of assessment growth. The reds is the one area, and again, the 2011-12 ArcelorMittal uh, appeal has an impact in, as it relates to Ward 3. So again, you're seeing in terms of average assessment growth, higher concentrations in Wards 11, 12, and 15. You're seeing 9, 7, 8, and 2 
having uh, as well higher than average uh, assessment growth values or figures. Again, over the period 2011 to 15. And coming back now to tie in the building uh, permit activity to assessment growth. Committees asked us in previous years, why isn't there a perfect alignment in terms of the building activity to the assessment growth? One of the reasons is that assessment is not determined based on the building uh, value, building activity value. There isn't a perfect correlation between the two. Uh, so just to illustrate that, uh, in the case of Homewood Suites by Hilton downtown in 2012, the building permit value was $26.5 million, but the assessed value of that property in 2014 was $14 million. So again, building permit value does not translate directly into assessed value. And so that's one example of that. So I just want to uh, break down what transpired in 2010 and 2012 in terms of the differences between building permit value and assessed value. So in 2010, uh, again, a period of high, higher uh, building permit values. Of that uh, record high in 2010, approximately 100, just short of 200 million of that was related to government development, which does not contribute to property tax revenues. They are exempt. So again, in terms of that building, Permit uh, values of just over a billion dollars, about 200 million of that, or just less than a fifth of that, we do not realize any property tax benefit from, as it is uh, their government or institutional. And then in 2010, again, it reflects a very high reliance on residential. So in 2009, we had approximately $282 million in building permit values in uh, residential. In 2010, that grew to $590 million. So again, it reflects that high reliance on residential development, uh, building permits, as well as assessment. Moving on to 2012, uh, I mentioned in 2010, we had approximately $200 million in, in building permits related to government. In 2012, that grew to $400 million, $406 million of building permit activity that is not contributing to property tax. Uh, so again, to identify the differences between the building permit activity and assessment value. Uh, I, also, there were, in terms, I mentioned the Homewood Suites. Another example of the difference between uh, building permit value an assessment would have been the Maple Leaf Foods and Canada Breads, which had higher building permit values uh, than assessment. Also the lag, I mentioned in previous presentations in terms of the lag. So while there's building permit activity in 2012, uh, so for example, oops. Stephanie. There we go. So in 2012, we had some uh, building activity uh, such as, uh, I believe, um, Maple Leaf Foods, uh, but it didn't hit our assessment roll to 2014. So just the, in terms of the lag, there's a natural lag between building permits before it gets to substantial completion and occupancy before it's captured on our assessment roll. So again, just identifying why we're seeing a lag, but again, we're seeing the trends that we expect to see. Building activity in 2012, some of it institutional government that's not contributing to the assessment growth. Uh, nonetheless, some of that activity is being captured in future years on the assessment world 2014. So we're seeing the trends that we expect to see as it relates to building permit values and assessment. So that represents, I don't believe I have an end slide, but that is the uh, end of the presentation. And through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Great. Well, I have an extensive list. I have Councillor Collins, Councillor Marula, Councillor Partridge, Councillor Brenda Johnson, Councillor Jason Farr, and Councillor Marie Pearson. So, Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, uh, Mike, to you and your staff for um, 
preparing the report, it's exactly when I put the motion to committee about the assessment trends and growth patterns, it's exactly what I was looking for in terms of what you present. Um, it, it's hard. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions, and I put it, I'll ask them in the context of. I just want to know how we how things can get better. So I don't want to be critical on a day when we're certainly celebrating the amount of growth that we see in the community. As you've referenced, it's one of the best years we've seen in, in, in a decade. So the questions that I ask are not to be critical, but um, certainly things can always improve, and, and that's why we continue to look at trends and other things related to growth development. So when I look at the information that you've provided, um, two things immediately stick out. One is that we're seeing growth too heavily weighted in the residential sector. And the second part of that is we're seeing growth in from a geographic standpoint in not the, I don't want to say in the wrong areas, but um, it in areas where it, many would consider it unsustainable. So I, I'm wondering why when you look at the map and we have nine business parks, if memory serves me right, in the city. Why we don't see some of the purple color-coded assessment growth around many of those business parks. Uh, when I look at that map, that's all residential, right? So that, that sticks out, that it's, it's intense growth in the residential areas on the fringes, and it's not industrial growth in areas where that we've paid a lot of money to service. And so maybe the, maybe it's an unfair question to you, Mike, as the finance person who's tracking this trend. Maybe it's something I should be asking ECDEV or, or planning, but I, I, I put it out there in that context, and I know that's a very high-level question. But I, that, those two things, and I've complained about them in the past, in fact, that's why I've asked for this report here today, because I think a picture tells a thousand words, as the saying goes. But I, I, I need to know what can we do better in order to shift the color codes to business parks and industrial areas rather than residential subdivisions. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I, I can start in terms of some of our uh, fiscal policies, uh, council approved policies to try to affect those forms of development. Uh, and then maybe Jason or Chris uh, want to jump in. So council has approved some uh, fiscal policies to try to incent that uh, industrial or commercial development. You'll recall as it relates to our development charges that we have a uh, stepped or lowered uh, recovery from industrial development charges. So council has made a concerted effort through setting those industrial development charges and trying to incent uh, industrial development. In fact, where there's expansion of existing uh, commercial industrial, again, we have a policy where we provide some exemption on that expansion. So, so that's an example where we have tried to incent uh, development in terms of commercial, or sorry, industrial. As it relates to office space, uh, I have reported to Council previously, there was an independent study that looked at uh, the cost of office space and all-in costs, that would be the development charges, land acquisition, property taxes in the city of Hamilton ranked very favorable to our GTA uh, surrounding municipal uh, partners uh, and even outside the GTA. So there's another example in terms of our commercial tax rates, uh, our development charges where we have incent we've developed an incentive of trying to realize some office space development. So, so again, I'm not trying to uh, reflect on what's transpired in ter terms of that, those developments, industrial and uh, office space, but I do want to remind committee members that you have approved policies in an effort to try to realize some growth in those sectors. City Manager, Chris Money, or sorry, uh, Jason Thorne. Uh, th through the chair, I was, I was going to add to it to Mike's response. I think you know one of the issues we see is um, we're, we're running out of lands, service lands in our industrial parks. So that's a piece that uh, um, ECDEV is working on uh, very closely. I, I, you know, the, the hope is that we'll start to see the AEG area start to emerge as a uh, as a dark blue spot on that map going forward. Uh, one of the, the um, 
Uh, figures that I reported on in the PD presentation was around our industrial vacancy rate, which is sitting at about 2.6%, which is uh, uh, quite a bit below the average in the region in terms of uh, uh, industri ready to go vacant industrial buildings on the market. So uh, the, the, on the supply side is one of the areas that uh, we're looking at in NECDEV as well. So from a percentage standpoint, if, if it's been referenced in economic, successive economic um, development reports, that um, industrial land supply is a, is a big issue locally. What percentage of our lands do we have remaining? If, if all nine business parks are 100% of the industrial land supply, what percentage of those parks are remaining for development from a percentage standpoint? I know that we like to talk in hectares and acres and, you know, there, there's, it's scattered throughout the city, but if what's left on a, in a global per percentage basis in terms of availability for someone who arrived tomorrow and said, I want to create or construct a new uh, industrial building in the city? Clarification, you look for your shovel ready, uh, Councillor, yep. as well? Yep. So through the chair, sorry, I, I, I can't give you a ballpark on that. My, my recollection in terms of... Um, uh, city controlled lands um, we have um, almost nothing in terms of lands that we can we can make available there are some privately controlled lands one of the issues with the privately controlled lands is we have had since instance where we've had interest in those lands um, in terms of willing developers and buyers but not willing sellers um, so that's been one of the issues we've been facing as well as the actual uh, some of the access we were able to have in the Ancaster business park for example is because we controlled some of the lands we would initially opened up and we were able to use that to, to leverage some of the initial investment um, so uh, there is uh, very little to none in terms of actually city-controlled shovel-ready lands. Um, I, I'd, I'd have to uh, get back to you on a figure for the actual lands held in private hands that are, are, are serviced and vacant. Well, I think it's an important question because if we're pushing, the, if the premium tax class is the industrial sector and we're, we're leaving it to private owners who have vacant brownfield properties, who may have parcels on the fringes of some of our business parks, if we're not controlling and driving industrial development, um, then we're leaving it to others, speculators who may have no interest in developing their lands, then it, it creates a problem. And I, if I can ask Mike to go to the other chart that... Uh, Councillor Collins, can you wait for a second? I think Councillor, oh, sorry. Or sorry, the city manager wanted to respond. Just, I think, really quickly, I mean, don't want to lose sight of what's happening with U.S. Steel. I mean, there are several hundred acres of uh, potentially developable land that I know Deloitte and their presentation by Sheila Botting talked about the importance of as soon as possible. So U.S. Steel uh, negotiations um, to work with, uh, you know, uh, Port Authority and, and maybe others to uh, have, um, you know, maybe a bit better control over the future of those lands, which I think will turn that orange spot that Mike is showing up on the map into hopefully uh, something more positive in the in the coming years ahead. So, but not losing sight of your comment, Councillor, I think, you know, obviously when we control things, we can make things happen. So we may have to start to think about how better to invest in lands that uh, uh, are available in industrial areas that um, might be available for sale now or in the future uh, that we can then turn into de economic development activity. Thanks, Chris. And you, you've kind of scooped me on one of my future questions, which was the port and the airport. And, and there's, n I mean, they're not even in the shades of purple. They're not even, <laughs> if I'm using the color codes, they're basically, they're treading water at this point. And in fact, as you've mentioned, Stauco, the Stauco lands in the lower Bayfront area are, are trending in the wrong direction. So. Uh, you know, I would like, at the, and I was going to ask that this become a, an annual exercise. We, this is the kind of stuff that we need more often at committee. And, uh, generate some good debate because you've referenced policies, Mike, policies that we have in place that obviously aren't working in certain areas that need to be tweaked. And again, I, I'm not, I'm not raising any of these questions to be critical. I just want to do better, and so I, I need to rely on the expertise of our staff to understand how we can. Or right the ship in some areas, if you want to call it that. And I would like to see in the future a map that superimposes the business parks um, uh, as it relates to um, the color-coded uh, heat maps that you've provided. So uh, back to the question in terms of the industrial land supply, I understand that the Stelco situation will take probably years to sort itself out in terms of understanding who the future owners are, how those lands will be developed, there's a, a, a massive issue as it relates to remediation of the lands if, in fact, someone is looking at something other than heavy industry. 
So we're talking years before we're in a situation where we'll start to talk about prospective investment in the Stelco lands, actually seeing, seeing shovels in the ground. And, and I, my question regarding the airport is how far away are we from having something around the airport that says, again, open for business, available for lease, uh, um, um, open for investment, whatever term or brand you'd like to use. When, is, when could we prospectively see growth trending in the other direction around the airport, which, again, it's hard to discern on the map where it is, but it, I don't see any uh, purple or shaded dark areas around that area of the city. Sorry so, for the preamble with that. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure that we have uh, information available today in terms of what our forecast is as it relates to that growth, but it's information that we need to come back to committee because uh, as we further identify and assess our uh, policies in terms of trying to incent or realize the pattern of development we're hoping to achieve is we're going to have to set some outcomes and some objectives. And uh, so we'll have to work with council at uh, a future date and setting those outcomes and objectives as it relates to either AGD um, forecast development or around Bayfront Park or around what we haven't discussed and it really represents a significant risk to us is further erosion in the existing commercial uh, assessment base. So we're continuously challenged through the assessment appeal process as it relates to retailers. So currently the the Walmarts, the Shopper Drug Marts, the Home Depots, I believe Lowe's have settled. Those are outstanding appeals that could have an impact of further eroding our commercial assessment base. So uh, I just want to highlight as important as growth is uh, in terms of affecting that ratio and affecting our ability to generate revenues, it's equally important that we try to protect our existing commercial industrial assessment base. Thank you for that, Mike. I don't think it's wrong to have residential growth. In fact, and I, I don't think it's wrong to, to grow the economy and provide housing products that people are obviously interested in buying. That you know, We wouldn't see purple on the map in Flamborough and, Glam and Binbrook and, and on the mountain if, um, if people weren't interested in buying homes there. So it's a very desirable place to live. The, the unfortunate part of it is it's too weighted in that area. If that number was 1.3 for residential growth, and 0.6 or 0.7 for industrial commercial, then I'd say, you know, we're, we're really trending in the right direction. But from the answers that have been provided today, it's as if we're settling for residential growth. We're going to continue to rely on that. Uh, I'll be quite blunt in asking the question, do we see anything different next year, the year after, or the year after that, let's say in the next five years, that suggests that we'll be anywhere, um, that we'll see anything different uh, in terms of weighted assessment between heavy reliance on residential growth in the outlying areas and industrial commercial growth um, anywhere else in the city, whether it's in a suburban business park or in the core of the city. But do we see anything other than that on the horizon? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I would turn to the building permit information as a indicator of what we will be realizing in terms of assessment growth. And we're continuing to trend with a higher concentration of residential building permit activity. So in the near future, we would expect similar trends in terms of the split between residential and uh, non-residential. But again, coming back to the councillor's reference to uh, in the splits and the tax ratios, um, committee often is challenged in terms of generating revenue. And I would just point to this as our ability to generate revenue in its simplest form is if we're able to affect the non-residential development, which has a higher tax ratio, that is going to provide us the greatest ability to generate revenues and affect our tax competitiveness going forward. So again, that's one of the reasons I've highlighted it in my presentation today, is just to remind Council of the benefit of those tax ratios and also the uh, need to try to affect this ratio in res and non-res assessment. So my final question would be, what policies then need to change in order to get us to a point where we can boast to Southern Ontario and beyond that we have more industrial lands available than, than our com competitors, that we um, 
are focused on heavy, I don't say heavy industrial, we're focused on all kinds of industrial development, whether it's prestige or otherwise, that we have, you know, um, product available for people to come to our city and invest. I mean, I, I, you know, I know we did our industrial land supply study. We've pushed everything we could to the airport in terms of trying to get that development ready. But I, I'm not seeing any, anything in terms of trends. And I love to look at trends. And again, I, I really thank you for the information today because it, it really helps us. We somehow need to be in a position where our industrial areas are the purple instead of subdivisions in different parts, but residential subdivisions. So what, what kind of direction do we need to provide today? Do we need to provide direction to staff to say, come back with a shopping list of alternatives that helps us um, generate more industrial assessment, which is the most lucrative for the city as it relates to creating jobs and, and creating new assessment? Uh, it's obviously more sustainable, I, I would suspect. And um, so where, where do we go from here in light of the information today? And again, I don't want to be critical. I just want to get better. So I, I'm not raining on anyone's parade. I think it's great to see the numbers. It's going to help us today in terms of get to a more reasonable tax rate. But, it, you know, 10 years from now, this, this trend can't continue. It's not sustainable. We got the city manager, Chris Murray. So if I can, just on that, I think the timing is uh, important, uh, especially in light of the fact that we're going to be coming back in front of you to talk about priorities as they relate to the federal and provincial government and funding uh, that is going to be made available. I mean, we're seeing now that there's, uh, the federal government has talked about a, a uh, running a deficit in the next few years, and, and we're understanding that that is well into the billions is what they're contemplating. So. Um, so now is certainly the time to talk about uh, not just the things that we need to fix in the way of housing and, and, and infrastructure that's aging, but areas where we need to invest. And, and certainly by giving us the direction, we can come back with a suite of things that we think are, are, are timely and appropriate at this point in time. I know that we incent the residential development in parts of the city. Uh, so there's a fixed amount of money that we make available to support uh, certain type of development in, in certain geographic areas. We may want to start to think about other ways that we can further incent the, uh, uh, our, industrial, um, uh, our industrial areas of the city. I, I just want to make one mention. I, I know we talked about U.S. Steel and the, uh, the, the potential of uh, hundreds of acres of land being made available and if put in the right hands uh, can certainly uh, help us uh, in the short to medium term. Uh, I understand from talking with the HPA that there is no shortage of businesses that want to be in that waterfront. They are at capacity right now in terms of available land. So there's a pent-up demand that in that area alone, in the short to medium term, could be addressed once this matter relating to U.S. Steel is resolved through the courts. So it's not a matter of waiting 10 years or anything. But, um, you know, we're going to, I'm assuming we're going to get direction to give you a whole host of ideas as to um, what it will take to uh, further incent these areas so we can start to see the, the darker colors uh, emerge, uh, not, you know, by the, the next generation's time, but by our generation's time. Um, and so we can certainly do that and uh, we can connect, help uh, council connect the dots when it, uh, as it relates to federal and provincial government uh, funding that may be help, uh, helpful to leverage what we want to accomplish. Thanks for that, Chris. And if you could come back to me at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to provide that direction. Thank you. Uh, we do have an extensive list. Uh, Councillor Sam Marula. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me, let me start off by, I guess, um, stating a couple things, and not to repeat what Councillor Collins has said. A number of us over the years have been focused in on the ratio of um, residential versus industrial and commercial, and how that has drastically changed between the 50s and the 60s versus that of today. So if you could just briefly, to you, Mr. Chairman, um, could you just elaborate, uh, in, in our growth, um, in our history during the 50s and 60s when we saw probably the most significant growth, what would that ratio have been at that time? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I don't have the specific ratios, but in terms of this comparator, we would be, in the 50s and 60s, we would 
been uh, reporting ourselves, sorry, to the right side of this comparator group. So on the right side, you'll see Mississauga has a mix of 75% residential and 25% non-residential, and that would have been the ratio that uh, this community would have reported likely back in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. It could have also been greater, uh, I, I presume, um, being that our industrial core was so significant yeah. at the time. So, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if we would have looked at the old city of Hamilton, yes. Yeah. Okay. And through you, Mr. Chairman, when, when we're looking at the competitiveness of that fact, and if we look over the, over the last 15 years, that number is actually uh, getting worse rather than better. And a lot of people, not all taxation is created equally, meaning through you, Mr. Chairman, that the suburban sprawl type of taxation, uh, for every dollar we're charging a resident, we're paying far more in return to provide all the necessary services. So I think it's important to elaborate on because there's a misconception that when, when X amount of dollars are being paid on an annual basis of residential taxes, that, that it's a significant amount, but the reality is it's being heavily subsidized to provide all of the services that taxpayer is, is receiving from a residential component. Uh, education, parks and rec, police, fire, ambulance, the list goes on, 260 services. So could you elaborate on that type of pressure that's applied on the general levy from a residential tax base as opposed to an industrial commercial tax base? So through, uh, through the chair, what I will speak to is the development charges uh, as it relates to growth. So council has taken a position, you've uh, reported to the province as the province is looking at the Development Charge Act that growth should pay for growth. And we know that as it relates to development charges because of exemptions that are legislated by the province as well as discretionary exemptions that uh, what municipalities collect in terms of development charges does not cover the cost of uh, servicing that development. In the case of the City of Hamilton, the annual uh, shortfall is probably in the area of $14 million combined between water, wastewater, storm exemptions as well as uh, our tax supported exemption. So specific to development charges, which is one of our principal revenue tools as it relates to servicing the growth, there is a shortfall. Growth does not pay for growth. Council has taken the position that growth should pay for growth as a province reviews the Development Charge Act and has already made some amendments. Uh, in terms of the operating impacts, uh, I leave it up to one, some of the operating departments. Uh, I'm not sure that we've ever done an analysis in terms of variable costs uh, providing uh, programs in suburban areas versus, uh, for instance, lower city. Right. And it's not so much about dividing suburban versus, versus urban, just residential versus commercial and industrial. Yeah. I think that's the, an important... Uh, yeah, and, and just, just on that point, Councillor, and, and if I didn't, uh, and, and I didn't allude to it, and, and I apologize, is uh, again, in terms of the potential revenue benefit, there's obviously a potential revenue benefit in realizing more commercial industrial development, but there may be an operating benefit as well in that some of the services that we provide as it relates to social services, housing, uh, public health, those are not necessarily property owners who are users of those services, recreation. Their employees are users, but as property owners and, and properties that contribute to the tax base, they aren't directly users of the services. So there is, beyond the revenue benefit, there could be an expenditure benefit as well by affecting that ratio in that uh, we would have a higher concentration of properties that aren't necessarily utilizing the same level of service as a residential property owner. That's the point. And, and through you, Madam Chair, what I'd like to do is actually capture what that number is. So for every dollar that we're collecting in residential taxes, what I'd like to know is what the average amount is we're being spent on providing those services and whether or not that's a feasible means of addressing the issue of capturing what that amount might be. And I'll work with you offline to try to establish how we do that yeah. <laughs> uh, versus that of commercial and, res and industrial because clearly in an industrial area you're not providing parks, rec schools um, and, and other multitude of, of services hence you're, you're charging more getting a return a higher return and providing less services common sense prevails it's far more profitable uh, when you have a higher commercial and right. industrial tax base. 
which brings us to a couple of the points that Councillor Collins had been, had been making regarding competitiveness and how we can strategically focus in on means of increasing our commercial and industrial base and how we can develop perhaps a strategic plan in targeting what that number can be and how we can attain it. So through you, Mr. Chairman, if we were to pursue, an, oh, Madam Chairman, pursue a, a, an exercise of targeting, of targeting a number to 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 use as a as a target, would that be a realistic exercise? Firstly, uh, in saying we want to increase our industrial commercial base by X amount per year for the next three years, and then seeking out a plan of action to accommodate that target. So through through the chair. Um one option in terms of how to proceed as it relates to setting some outcomes or objectives would be uh, to have staff report back as to where there may be serviced a service land to accommodate growth in the short term. And uh, I don't want council to be consumed just in terms of new growth. Uh, there is also opportunities for existing commercial industrial property owners to expand and grow and we need to equally be focused on helping to facilitate those property owners on the potential expanding and growing as well. So in terms of how, how to proceed, that may be an exercise that you can leave with staff in terms of options on how to report back in part through the development of the strategic plan and the objectives as to some short term, medium term and longer term outcomes or targets as it relates to affecting the commercial and industrial uh, assessment base in a positive way. But the appropriate time, and I'll work with the wording with you on that particular issue, but I'd like to move that uh, accordingly. And in dealing with those competitiveness issues and the supply issue that you're mentioning, because we're dealing with a new inventory versus the older inventory and how we can marry the two to have a, a better reflection of a global impact, that will, 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 we will pursue. But when looking at, for instance, time frames and flexibility and perception surrounding doing business in the city. I know that um, we had discussed to you, Madam Chair, the perception of Hamilton being a very difficult place to do business and how the messaging out there has still, to some degree, exists, even though we've, we've made some drastic improvements. So do you feel, and the, the, do we as a city feel, that we've made the necessary changes within the Economic Development Department to ensure that in reality, and not by perception, in reality those improvements are seeing a tangible return for investment. So through the Chair, I'm going to leave that one to Jason and Chris. Yes, so through the Chair, um, that's obviously one of the, the core initiatives of, uh, of PED and working closely with PW is on, is on the Open for Business initiative and um, the, the areas that we're focused on are on um, a lot of the process improvement issues. So how can we um, turn around uh, uh, licensing, planning approvals, building approvals uh, as fast as we can? Um, I think we've made uh, we made a number of process improvements over the past year or so. Um, and um, I, I think one of our next challenges is going to be providing uh, um, uh, timeline tracking and timeline benchmarking, um, which can then be part of the, the, the marketing message that we're setting out to the broader business community. Um, I can tell you one of the things that we've had great success with and we've had um, a lot of positive feedback on with when we're dealing with um, particularly uh, um, new builders to Hamilton in the industrial sector is the, is the, the, the sort of one-stop approach that they can get when they come in and they can meet at the same time with, uh, with ECDEV can pull together planning and building and licensing staff um, and provide a fairly clear path forward to, um, to construction. Um, we've had especially positive feedback when we've been dealing with um, uh, new investors in the city. Um, and what the ECDEV staff will tell you as well is where we've had some of our best success in terms of growing assessment um, is, as Mike said, is with some of the retention and expansion. Um, so a lot of our, our corporate outreach programs have um, have caught businesses that may have been looking to expand and may have been looking to expand outside the city and been able to find them spaces to relocate within the city um, and have been able to help facilitate um, expansions, which we've had a number of successes in the past year of having those move through uh, approvals uh, extremely quickly. Okay, so along the competitiveness and the openness for business, that component 
uh, we are we are pursuing and we're we're doing well and we're we're battling the perception that we're not open for business and that's and that's a good sign. Now looking at um, legislation that needs to be changed potentially. Currently, industri industry or industrial properties and commercial properties are being taxed at a highest and best use component. Is that correct? So, uh, through the chair, in terms of our um, our uh, property classes, we have one property class that is still protected, and that's our industrial, our uh, large industrial property class. We can only pass on 50% of our property tax change to that class because it is above that fairness threshold that is determined set by the province. So again, uh, previously we would have had commercial and industrial, commercial through previous decisions of council where we positively uh, affected that ratio such that they've now fallen outside of that protected uh, category. Uh, with the exception of large industrial, we're now able to distribute or share that tax burden across all the classes. So again, industrial, if I look at our forecast property tax changes is uh, I would I would forecast that that industrial class uh, will likely continue to be protected probably for another 18 to 19 years. That is um, a very important distinction for those that might believe that we're not providing any tax incentives for commercial and industrial. That um, shift of, of burden on has been going on for approximately 16 years, is that correct? Did it start in around 2000? Uh, so through you, uh, through you, Chair, I believe it was maybe since 98. Oh, since 98. Yeah. yeah. And that was the business reduction, business tax reduction program, is that correct? Yeah. So through the Chair, uh, the City of Hamilton did utilize that business tax reduction to reduce the commercial burden so that uh, it was no longer a protected class and so that we can levy uh, fully onto our commercial class and we weren't restricted by only half of the levy. In fact, I believe at one point it wasn't even half of the levy. You weren't able to pass on any of the tax impact. And, and that would play to you, Madam Chair, as a significant incentive for those wanting to invest in the city and something that we, I, I presume, are promoting uh, accordingly. And in competition with other municipalities, where do we stand with respect to ratios or competitiveness? Yeah. So through, uh, through the chair, we would have reported previously and uh, we will be reporting this year as well through our um, business, or sorry, our tax competitiveness study where we are in terms of residential, commercial, industrial. And in terms of industrial, we continue to be uh, slightly higher than our average. Uh, and in terms of residential, in terms of cap, uh, competitiveness, it has improved um, since 2001-2. I believe then we were at 15% above and now we're at that 8 or 9%. And industrial, I believe we're slightly higher than the average. But again, the important trend is we are improving both on our residential and in commercial. Industrial, because of that historical reliance on industrial, we are uh, we continue to be slightly higher than our comparator groups. And so I need to emphasize the trend of, of moving toward, towards the right uh, direction. Also, with respect to the vacant unit tax rebate, can you elaborate on that and how uh, a change is necessary in order to address what I believe to be a, a very problematic issue? So through the chair, uh, it, is, it was one of those recommendations that council uh, put forward to the province as the province was looking at the Municipal Act uh, as well as the Development Charge Act. As it relates to vacant commercial properties, uh, those property owners each and every year can put forward a request for a rebate, and I believe the rebate's 30%, a vacancy rebate. Uh, one of the recommendations uh, from staff and council to the province was to have a term limit on those vacancy rebates. So in the case uh, to illustrate in case where a property owner may be speculating and uh, really has no incentive on having commercial activity in that property, each and every year that property can remain vacant and they could benefit by applying for that 30% rebate. Uh, the recommendation from staff and council was one option is to have a term limit such that a property could only realize that rebate, for instance, for one year. 
uh, and not each and every year. And so having that legislative change would assist municipalities in trying to turn around properties that may be derelict or that aren't contributing in terms of economic activity such that they're contributing to economic activity. So that's an illustration where uh, the province of Ontario hopefully will consider amending the legislation to allow municipalities either the flexibility of, uh, of applying that vacancy rebate in the same manner it's being applied today or, for instance, having a term limit such that a property owner can receive that rebate only as of one time. And that's one term limit that I can subscribe to. So uh, that's something that we've already formally um, responded to, I presume, and, yes. yeah. and we've addressed. Um, now, on, lastly, with respect to where we have been and where we're headed, I think this is a time when I'm going to bring up the LRT, and I, what I believe will play a role in reversing this trend. Clearly, what we're seeing, Madam Chair, is an influx of Torontonians, increasing residential and commercial properties within the core as a result of their liking of focusing in on the older part of the city. Um, where the people are will, and where that reversed brain drain occurs, I believe companies will follow. And Mike, perhaps you might not want to answer this, but maybe somebody uh, related to LRT can. If you could just elaborate on the importance of having this in this reverse brain drain uh, existing in Hamilton and how the demand will increase as a direct result of, of these transplanted Torontonians, professionals, moving to Hamilton and how that will be a catalyst to business um, moving to Hamilton. And I, when I say business, I mean headquarters as opposed to uh, smokestacks. So can somebody just elaborate on that? So through the chair, a, a, a couple of uh, comments. Um, one is, uh, you know, something that we anticipate the LRT doing is um, uh, spreading the reach of some of the activity we're seeing in the downtown core, spreading that further east and west in the lower city. Um, we certainly have heard, um, as, as, we're, as we're meeting with potential investors in the city, is the, the access to not just the Toronto market, but the, the, the GTA market is very important. So, so access along that Lakeshore uh, GO Train corridor um, is key, and the LRT um, creates more sites that have direct access to that Lakeshore corridor um, uh, across the GTA. Um, so, so that is key as well. Um, the, other, um, the other issue we're seeing, and, and, and uh, to speak to the earlier question about sort of trends, what was interesting, I think, in the building permit trends in 2015 um, is that we hit the billion dollars as we have in previous years, but we hit it without any major, big major projects, um, which was sort of what carried the day in some of the previous uh, years. So especially on the commercial side, what we saw was um, a lot more permit, a lot more, a lot more smaller value permits, which rec which um, I, I think uh, uh, picks up a lot of the smaller scale uh, commercial activity. Um, uh, a lot of that is what we were seeing in some of the lower city. Um, so the the extent to which some of those um, uh, newcomers into Hamilton are um, um, setting up smaller shops, um, setting up smaller um, offices, we're seeing that that's certainly a trend. I think we're starting to see, and we're starting to see that in the types of building permits that were issued. Excellent. And, and through you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, with respect to potential bonusing programs, if we were to ask for special treatment um, related to the taxation component of industrial and commercial lands, and let's say hypothetically speaking we were to ask for an exemption um, and provide a bonus structure to attract a new business, would and could that be something we could pursue, uh, similar to what we did with the Brownfield uh, grants and so on, which were considered incentives through you, Madam Chair, or Mr. Chairman. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll start, and I'm not sure if Jason wants to jump in. Under the Municipal Act, there are uh, legislative restrictions in terms of bonusing, and the province just doesn't want to see one municipality competing in a different manner to another municipality. Uh, notwithstanding the legislative restrictions in terms of bonusing, there are, I mentioned, our uh, development charges. So we'd have varied development charges in case of industrial. We have discounted development charges in case of uh, industrial commercial that are uh, experiencing an expansion where we waive uh, the <laughs> development charges, I believe, on 50% of the expansion. So there are uh, policies, fiscal policies, that uh, we can consider to help incent those forms of development. And lastly, if we could somehow pinpoint um, accurately why certain companies 
don't move to Hamilton. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, we have a number of businesses looking at Southern Ontario. We assess uh, those that are basically knocking on people's doors. We determine they end up in Mississauga rather than Hamilton. Do we have an exit uh, interview with those companies as to why they chose Mississauga over Hamilton? I put that through to Neil. Yeah. Hear the question. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Mr. I'll, Chairman. Through I'll you, I didn't hear it. Yeah, sure. So, if we know, if we are knowingly in discussions with certain companies, and we know that they're looking at Southern Ontario, and the Golden Horseshoe is an example, and we know that they're, they're knocking on Hamilton's door, but they choose to go to Mississauga or Niagara or somewhere else in the Golden Horseshoe, do we conduct a exit or an exit interview with that company to determine why they decided not to move to Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, my comment on that is Mississauga and Niagara, oh, sorry, Mississauga and Niagara aren't really large competitors, uh, as particularly Mississauga and anything in the GTA. If you look at the, the combination between the value per acre of land and the development charges, uh, we are okay. significantly much more competitive than okay. those neighbors. All right, so forget that I said Niagara, Minnesota, just any other municipality. If, if we can somehow formulate an exit interview uh, as to why they choose another city versus Hamilton, I think would go a long way from my perspective in understanding what may need to change in order to retain them. That business. So through you, Mr. Chairman, the question is, do we have an exit interview with any of these businesses that knock on our door but choose not to, not to invest here? Uh, Mr. Chair, we do not have a formal exit strategy, uh, but most of us um, in the Economic Development Division work very closely with the company, and if there's a reason they're leaving, then uh, we would uh, know I think if we could perhaps, through you, Mr. Chairman, and at the appropriate time, if I could provide a motion accordingly, I think that information is golden and something that can assist us in creating policies or advocate legislative change in order to fill whatever vacuum might be existing. So at the appropriate time, I'll move that as well. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Judy Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, my good information and presentation and, um, uh, you know, kudos to your staff because I, I know you always say it's the team behind you that's uh, bringing it together. Could you go to uh, slide number three, please? Sorry. There. Yeah, that's good. Um, under the, uh, just a quick question, under the industrial figures, in, in, within those figures, are the appeals factored in? So through uh, you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes. So this is uh, net growth, you'll see net. So it is both the new construction supplementary that are increasing our assessment, and what we've netted off is the write-offs and the successful appeals. Okay. So the net number is 1.6, and I, I want to take this opportunity to thank staff who've worked hard to compile this for you to have today is what the gross number is and what that appeal figure is. But what we were able to compile for today is is the net figure of 1.6%. Okay, thank you. And and when can we expect the rest of the information? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I will bring it as soon as it's available. Okay. Uh, staff, uh, as we continue to support the budget process leading into the tax policies, uh, I would hope that sometime after that we'll have some time to uh, develop the gross and the appeal numbers to okay. give you a breakdown. Yeah, that's that's fine. You're a little busy right now. Um, slide number eight, if you could go to that next, please. In the last uh, bullet, where we talk, you, t you mentioned with the McMaster Innovation Center that it is now exempt from taxes. How did that happen? It was always my understanding from the beginning well, one of the reasons we were so excited about it is that it was going to be contributing taxes. What happened? So through uh, you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I haven't the specific, I would have to report back on the specific, but uh, how these typically come about is there's an appeal that's put forward. In this case, I would expect that there would have been an appeal in terms of what would have been reported initially by MPAC as a accessible 
uh, portion of that facility would have been appealed uh, by MIP and obviously was successfully appealed as an extension of the education institution and therefore is exempt in terms of taxable assessment. So again, we can provide some further description of what had transpired, but typically the, those are the circumstances that arise in terms of moving from a taxable to an exempt. And, and I appreciate that, and, and through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think on that one, I, you know, I, I would like a little more information on that. Um, it's just a bit concerning that, you know, when the folks come in here and present such a great opportunity and how it's going to contribute to the city and the message we get around this table, if I remember correctly, was that it was going to contribute taxes and then, you know, uh, quietly down the road through whatever means was uh, open uh, to the folks down there, they um, end up being exempt, and, and I just I'm, I'm concerned about that. I think you know that's that's the wrong message, yep. the really wrong message to deliver to this council. So, so through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we will provide that information in, in detail. Uh, also, I want to identify efforts that, uh, in terms of staff working with Impact, to to uh, try to manage. Um, previous experiences whereby MPAC, for instance, has looked at a new development and come to a determination of the uh, ass assessment benefits only to have that challenge. So what we've done is working with MPAC as a partner, we've brought uh, Jason staff and MPAC staff together to try to eliminate that risk such that when MPAC is developing its initial assessment, it's doing so with best information. Uh, so again, what we're trying to, what I, I'm, I'm speaking to is we're trying to avoid a situation where MPAC makes assumptions that are inaccurate and results in, in future years, uh, the city of Hamilton having a shift or change in that taxable uh, assessed property. So we would have, as a illustration, in the case of Jackson Square some years ago, MPAC did not have uh, good lease information. They assessed it in a similar manner as Lime Ridge Mall. However, the rents were not similar to Lime Ridge Mall. So there's an example where we want to work with MPAC and our uh, property partners to try to provide the best information to avoid that confusion and to avoid where there might be an overestimate of assessment benefit. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I, I, I think that's good news. And um, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that. Mike, is this um, meeting with MPAC and with uh, the planning staff is, is uh, through Jason, is this something that has just started recently um, and, and is the plan to carry it on with all developments or just certain developments? Can you elaborate yeah. on that, please? So through, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, a few years back, Council approved an assessment officer, a uh, increased complement to our taxation area. One of the roles of the assessment officer is A, to try to protect our assessment base. So where there are appeals, that assessment officer reviews the files, determines whether or not the city needs to participate into the process, provides input either through impact or through the appeal process directly. Uh, but Another role of that uh, position as well is to try to facilitate that relationship between MPAC and planning uh, and trying to provide the best information to council at the time when council is deliberating on a particular development. So again, in the cases of a Canada Bread, a Maple Leaf, uh, the James Street development most recently, what we want to do is provide council with the best estimate as to what the tax benefit will be, and by doing so, trying to improve that relationship between MPAC and the city, we're trying to uh, narrow down the risk of having errors in those assessments just to realize a adjustment in future years, which is going to put our budget at risk. So again, it's, it's a, a mitigation strategy in terms of trying to mitigate the risk of overinflated assessments at the time when projects are put forward. Again, simply to have those adjusted in future years. That's excellent, Mike. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, again, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. When it comes to MPAC uh, assessments, do we get notified 
um, right away when there's an appeal for the uh, for the assessment, or is it once a decision has been made by MPAC? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we are informed of uh, appeals. Um, I did mention in terms of our risks as it relates to retail sector, so we're informed of specific appeals. Uh, we work with MPAC to try to assess the risk of uh, those appeals and it's part of my responsibility to uh, to manage and protect the corporation as it relates to those appeals so each year uh, we go through and we just recently as uh, last week went through the file of uh, appeals and try to assess the risk of each one of those appeals in terms of that assessment base all right thank you very much for those answers and, and mr. chairman um, you know certainly I appreciate uh, there's been very good discussion so far this morning and, and positive you know I, I, everything I think we're saying today is is in is in a positive light but also cautionary in, in some in some in some ways so I appreciate you um, getting back to us with the uh, McMaster Innovation Center tax exemption just to give us a little more meat on the bones for that and I will say that in Flamborough right now we have one city owned industrial park and we have one privately owned industrial park and we have two additional privately owned industrial parks coming on stream in 2016 and I know that you know certainly the privately owned ones they have a great deal of uh, incentive uh, to sell and 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 to um, you know get the businesses to move into the park and Neil I know that uh, you're aware of these industrial parks coming on stream um, I've been working with planning staff and uh, and also with the uh, the developers on them so you know I'm, I'm encouraged that as soon as we can get those on stream hopefully they will again um, being sustainable contribute to to uh, more of our assessment growth in you know in the in the next few years so not necessarily 10 15 years down the road but but very quickly so thank you mr. deputy mayor those are my questions thank you I have councillor Brenda Johnson thank you um, Mike if you don't mind going to slide number four I just want to put this on record that this is one contest I wish I wasn't winning um, but my question is and there's a, a few of them well involved in this on one hand it's a success story for real estate that the value of your home just increased and it's based on on impacts assessment and my understanding is that impact comes in how many times every four years so uh, through you mr. deputy mayor in terms of reassessment we're in the last year of a four-year phase in currently the next reassessment period will be 2017 to 2020. So again, it's a uh, the, the practice in the previous period, and we'll continue. I'm sorry, Mike, I can't hear you. So the practice in the previous period, and we'll continue into this next period of 2017 to 2020, is the change in reassessment will be phased in over the four years. But I'm going to pause for a second just to identify this information relates exclusively to new growth it's not the reassessment shifts we'll be bringing that information in 2017 as we get the reassessment information so again this is simply assessment growth that results from new development or from uh, changes to existing development where it might have been vacant and it was developed on or in addition to a home so again I just want to differentiate between reassessment shifts and the benefit of assessment growth okay, thank you for that because that was my next question so through you chair to um, Mike the 4.8 percent just shows the change of the percent it doesn't indicate that this is what Glambrook will be charged on top of the um, the levy increase that we are going to be proposing through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, no. And so I'll explain the 4.8, or I'll try to explain the 4.8. There's a column we haven't provided you just because of space. But in terms of uh, Ward 11 as a whole, we're reporting an unweighted assessment growth of just short of $300 million. If I took that $300 million as a as a percentage of the total assessment right. in Ward 11, that would represent approximately 5% of the total assessment. So that's how we arrive at the 5%. There's been an increase in assessed value from growth from new facilities or expansions of about 300 million, and that represents 
growth of about 5% of the assessed value in Ward 11. Thank you. So just for the record, it's not it's not showing that Ward 11 is paying 4.8% on top of everyone else. It's just yep. the percent of growth that's in the, that particular yep. ward. And, and uh, through you, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I appreciate the question because this in no way reflects a change in burden across the wards. What it reflects is the relief that each of these wards are contributing to in terms of the tax burn in 2016 as it relates to that 1.6%. There's $13 million in additional revenue that is helping to alleviate our tax impact in 2016 and what we've done is identified across those wards how they're contributing to that $13 million. Thank you. And given it's the second largest fastest growing ward, it would just, it, this should not be so much as a surprise. Um, could you please go to Ward, or sorry, Ward, could you please go to slide eight again? Thank you. Um, I was interested in seeing the uh, last bullet point. It said TransCanada pipelines decrease. Can you please explain, because we just had Enbridge come forward and talk about their pipeline, and I'm just wondering if there's a correlation here. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm looking to staff, and uh, we can provide that information in an email back to committee members. I don't have the specifics to that particular property. Thank you, because it looks like if TransCanada pipelines are have a decrease, formerly occupied, um, it looks like it's commercial units only. It's not the actual pipeline, so let's uh, try not to confuse the two. Uh, slide number nine, please. Thank you. Uh, increases in commercial property class include, is Navstar and Fibercast in that list as well? Because we just opened up Fibercast uh, and they're still being currently built. So maybe through you to Neil or to yourself, um, we have two big facilities that just came into Glanbrook. So I'm just wondering, um, are they here not here because they were from last year or they're not going to be added on until next year? Just out of interest. Yeah. So through, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we can identify A, I mentioned in terms of the legs, sometimes, or in terms of the lag between building and the assessment, there's a lag before it's captured onto our assessment roll. So we'll, we'll report back to committee as to whether or not it's in that transition of going from occupancy to the assessment roll or whether it was reported in previous years. Thank you. And if you can go to uh, your first map, the building permit construction um, constructive value, construction value. Thank you. Um, I think the headlines is very misleading, in my opinion, that Glamrock as a whole, when you take a look at where the growth and where the permits are, it's very limited to, to certain areas. It's not entire uh, Glamrock. If you were to physically take the map of Glanbrook, you could put it over top of the former city of Hamilton. It's actually geographically bigger. So when people see the words Glanbrook, they are assuming, and you don't even have a third of my Glanbrook on here because it falls off the map at the very bottom. Sinclairville is not included in this, in this growth uh, in Glanbrook, and neither is Blackheath and Woodburn and Alfra, um, Hannon. So I just wanted to put that out there as well, that it's really centralized in, in just the, the construction zones. Um, I have five, four of them in the Glenbrook area. So I just wanted to um, put that out there. And if you can go to the next map, please. During this presentation, you said that Lime Ridge also appealed, and that's why they have a decrease. And so that just prompted, and I, and I apologize if it's been asked and I wasn't paying attention. Are there any others in the hopper that we should, be, that we should know about right now so that we're not seeing any big surprises coming forward of, of appeals? Because Lime Ridge automatically made me assume Jackson Square, Eastgate Square, um, and all your other bigger um, commercial properties. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'd be happy to share because I'm happy that others can have some sleep, sleepless nights as well. That's great. So uh, we are having, um, we've assessed risks in a number of retail um, property owners, including Walmarts, I mentioned Shopper Drug Mart, Eastgate's one, uh, Canadian Tire. What we're noticing is Walmart is representing the benchmark and other retailers are waiting for the Walmart appeal to see where the Walmart appeal is settled and then their appeals will Reflect, reflect what transpired.
dollar as it relates to, to Walmart. But we're seeing competitiveness. We're seeing in terms of the rationale for the appeals is retailers are trying, are having to uh, diversify uh, out of, for instance, grocers are having to get into clothing uh, as well as seasonal goods. And uh, reportedly that is uh, having an effect on their margins. And for instance, that's one of the rationales for their appeals. Thank you. And if I can have some indulgence here, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, the Winona Walmart, which is now the Winona Costco, I keep getting calls about it. It's my, probably my one number one uh, request. We still don't know where that is in the hopper. We still don't know if they're coming forward. Even phone calls are not being answered. So I just wanted to put that out there as well, because that would also significantly add to the numbers that you see here in front of you. Okay, thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you. I have Councillor, um, oh, sorry, Jason Farr. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I guess I just made here. Uh, the slide with the 215 uh, building permit construction values. Mike, you said through you, Chair, uh, there's risks here. And then I think on the last slide you indicated that the risk is we're not, we can't measure building permits value with uh, it equally translating into assessment value. Was that what you were referring yeah. to when you referred to a risk on slide 11? So through uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, absolutely. So in terms of uh, what's transpiring in this uh, area of the downtown, one of the risks in terms of the correlation, people assuming construction, Construction value will translate uh, equally into assessment value as any of those institutional and government related, either education institutional or government, will not have the same property tax benefit as commercial residential. So that is the risk. And through you, Chair, to Jason, much of that, Jay, has already uh, occurred. So what we're looking at here at 215 building permit construction value, uh, wouldn't that essentially be uh, residential? And and soon to be online and occupied so people like Mike and his good staff can can then measure it accordingly through you? Through the chair, the councillor's correct. Uh, most of what we're seeing in terms of that, those, that representing the 2015 numbers is residential as well as some small scale commercial uh, mixed use. Okay, I was just scared when Mike said the word risk. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, slide and, and the note. So through you, I noticed Neil showed up. Councillor Collins has a motion I'm sure we're all going to support. Uh, um, and he, I, I had similar questions. Uh, Councillor Marula followed up on some of those questions. So I might, since Neil is here, is he still here? Yes. Oh, great. Through you to our Director of Economic Development, uh, Neil, how full up are we currently at development ready business parks? Uh, you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would say the majority of our business parks are, are very much close to to, uh, to full. The, ex the exception of that, of course, would be um, would be the Red Hill. We still have property left in there. We only own 25 acres, but there is there is property for development in the Red Hill Park. Uh, as Councillor uh, Partridge said, there is uh, there is available property uh, in the uh, Flamborough area, and uh, of course the the big ticket item would be the uh, 555 hectares uh, of the AEGD. That would be the, the future growth area. That was my, uh, and it looks like Councillor Marul is going to address it uh, formally in just a moment with a motion through you, Chair Daniel. Then how far are we from having some portion of uh, AEGD lands shovel ready? Uh, th through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I can't give you that number off the top of my head, but I can get it very quickly for you and email it to Council. Okay, I just thought maybe off the top of your head since you were here you might. Uh, I know Guy uh, would have that probably as well. I should have given him a quick text when Councillor Collins was asking his uh, questions or email. Uh, um, the current vacancy rate at our uh, inner core industrial lands, I, I think Jay said 2.2. What is that currently? Is that right, that number? Through the chair, the, uh, uh, I'll let Neil elaborate. The number that I reported on was the 2.6%, which was the vacant, build, uh, industrial, vacant industrial buildings. Um, and I believe the, the regional average in the GTHA is around 3.6 or 7%. Okay. Is that right? Through, uh, through uh, Mr. Chair, that, that is correct. 
but that's a significant increase from the one percent vacancy rate we've uh, industrial vacancy rate we've had to deal with over the last three years. Okay, and I know, Chair, and you were part of this as an planning committee, I believe. We were uh, very early on in the term talking about land banking through you to whomever. It might be Mike, it may be Jay, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we had a good, healthy discussion on it. Where did that land? Did we eventually uh, start at least uh, making attempts at it, or we were concentrating our efforts uh, monetarily elsewhere rather than investing in, in, in land? the chair I can speak so in in 2011 is when council set up um, an employment land banking reserve can't remember the exact title right um, that was set up with, with, with a four million dollar investment um, it, it, it hasn't been topped up since that time um, there has been expenditures I believe it's sitting now at just over two million um, um, I might ask, have to ask Neil to speak to some of the expenditures that one of the bigger ones was Fraunhofer um, where some of those investments were made, um, but that was a fund created in, in, in 2011. As I stated in one of the earlier questions, uh, the, the, the ability of the city to acquire or control some of the strategic employment lands has been one of the barriers we faced in terms of, uh, of attracting new industry to the city. Okay. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just to, in terms of the change that we made uh, in terms of the financing of the land banking reserve, you may recall uh, in the previous term of council, we had some competing demands in terms of parkland acquisition as well as waterfront development. So the strategy that we are employing now is in the future going forward, if there is any proposals coming forward that will provide a return on investment, we would look at a potential funding source for that at a, a, outside of the land bank reserve. So again, the rationale was not to levy funding and park it into a reserve for a future day, but to free up that funding capacity for other priorities, such as parkland and waterfront, and waterfront has a direct uh, economic uh, benefit. And in the future, if there are proposals coming forward, we would look at potential funding strategies or sources for, that, uh, for those proposals. So again, I just don't want to leave committee with an impression that we haven't any strategies in going forward as it relates to those developments. It's just that we're moving away from levying and parking that money aside for a future date to using that funding to move forward on waterfront and parkland. Yeah, I, I, through my questioning, was trying to uh, get at the fact that indeed we do, we have addressed in various ways uh, some of these issues being talked about today. And I think with the formal motions ahead, it will be helpful because it will be a reminder in some ways and it will be opportunities for people like Neil and others and you um, to, to sort of zero in focus. And, and Chris Murray, who talked about coming up with suites and options for us. Uh, to have that uh, debate in the near future. So no, I think they're timely motions, but but we certainly have had made, uh, made efforts, and I haven't even, so I've just scratched the surface here, and you too, uh, Mike. So I just want to, uh, I had to just uh, uh, one more question uh, that I'll go full circle uh, parochial through you, Chair, on uh, the parish in Heimbecker. Is that being measured here uh, today, Mike, in Ward 2, the 43, I think, or $44 million dollar uh, announcement on that expansion in the agra food industries in Ward 2? So through you, Mr. Bimar, I just have to check to see whether or not that's on the assessment role or if it's part of that transition from building activity to assessment role. So we can report back whether it's captured in this information or whether it would be reported in future years in terms of assessment impacts. Okay. I think likely future, but but I was just uh, trying to get that on the record, obviously. And finally, congratulations to Neil since he's here. Uh, we all received, as uh, um, my colleagues are and the mayor are aware, a note from Jason Thorne on some recent national uh, publicity. So I'll end my questioning on a, on a congratulatory and, and good note. Uh, the Diverse Economy article in the Star was fantastic. Uh, the Agri-Industry story in the Globe, uh, fantastic. And I very much like the... Um, uh, article on the uh, small business uh, uh, cake and loaf bakery right in Ward 1 and the great job they're doing and fair wage uh, policy that they have for a small business. So uh, congratulations to Neil and, and thanks for the presentation. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Pearson. Well, Mr. Deputy Mayor, thank you so much. And um, questions that I was going to ask have all been answered and I appreciate that because everybody's on the same lines today of what concerns there are. Uh, Mike, you mentioned with regards to the commercial um, issues that are coming forward. Are there any 
surprises that we've made background yeah. you're talking to the Lime Ridges the East Gate yeah. so through you uh, mr. deputy mayor each and every year we assess those risks and uh, we set aside allowances and that'll be part of our uh, staff discussions as it relates to our 2015 year-end um, what risk we may realize in making sure that we have an appropriate allowance uh, as it relates to those those challenges so again I just want to reassure committee that uh, we do have a practice an appropriate fiscal practice of setting aside allowances based on our assumptions around the risk thank you appreciate that and certainly have always keeping us surprised of what's going on uh, the McMaster situation that really does concern me as well as council of partridge raised that's not something that we uh, were um, anticipating when we approved that and provided funding there was a pocket of money that was provided to that uh, to get that park underway so there was a concern there um, and uh, I, as I say it's just um, it's just surprising I mean we also have the issues and maybe I'll raise it here nothing's been mentioned as far as heads and beds. status of that at the province because I know we've argued that for many years and I appreciate Councillor Marula raising the vacant unit tax because I was also going to ask that but on the heads and beds are we anywhere with regards to that as increases from the province yeah, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I was, I was hoping to avoid the heads and beds because I feel that each year I'm just banging my head up against a wall when we, we discuss the province needing to revisit the heads and beds. I, I believe it hasn't been revised since 87. So 1987, it was set at $75 per full-time student and the case of our uh, medical uh, facilities partners per bed. And that hasn't, uh, again, uh, been revised now for approaching 40 years. It's one of the requests that municipalities have put forward to the province is, A, to start amending that, and that's in some way either inflating it or starting to have some movement in terms of that funding source. Uh, but again, it is one of the challenges. If, if I look at that uh, heat map in terms of, uh, of Ward 1, um, Councillor Aidan Johnson's ward is, uh, you can see where where the uh, education partner lies in that heat map and uh, the lack of assessment benefit that's being realized from that particular property. Uh, so again, there ha doesn't seem to be any willingness by the province to revise, or reconsider that number, but uh, municipalities, uh, as the City of Hamilton, I think we've put forward over the years three or four uh, resolutions to have it amended but there doesn't seem to be any movement trying the last question I'm going to ask is also in, in connection with the institutional and get the taxes from the institutional what would the tax component be this year if we were to get last time was about 25 million dollars so I'm sure it's more than so so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I can provide that information when I bring the tax policies. You'll recall that we've, we've shown it as a range, either having it assessed as commercial or industrial or some range of assessment. But again, we can provide that as an indication if the province were to move away from that heads and beds methodology, what the revenue benefits in the city of Hamilton would be. Appreciate that, and it's always just a matter of trying to enlighten for the taxpayers to understand this is lost as far as lost revenue for us that we can't incorporate and bring down the tax taxes to them. Thank you. Very good question. I'm going to expand on that later. Uh, the, the heads of beds. Anyway, I uh, have Councillor, sorry, Mayor uh, Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I first also want to congratulate our Economic Development Department. I know Neil, you headed up, but it took a team effort by your whole group and, and to get that national coverage was outstanding and what stood out for me the most was comparing our unemployment rate with the rest of the country and the favorable position we're in so congratulations on that and that should maybe attract some more investment number two is Mike you said that last week we were at 2.1 percent with a 1 percent assessment increase we're now at 1.6 does that mean the impact of the levy has now been reduced subject to any other cuts or enhancements down to 1.5 percent so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's my next presentation. So if the councillor can be patient enough to the next presentation, I'll provide an update in terms of where we sit as it relates Perfect. to 26. Is that a yes or a no? Uh, it, will, it will be reflected as we're leaving pressure on that 2.1%. Focus on this slide. 
So it will further reduce it by 0 0.3. 0 0.3. 0 0.3. Not, not 0.6. We assumed through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've already assumed 1.3. Okay. 1.6 will provide an additional 0.3 against that 2.1. Or 1.8 now. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing that slide next. The other is uh, Council Collins is asking for some uh, policy changes that we could do to improve our commercial industrial assessment. And I have two examples. And Mr. Thorne is very aware of this. Uh, the Ancaster Industrial Park is fully built out on service land, but we have a significant amount of land left that's not serviced. And we've been trying for, well, the, it was approved in the budget in 2006 to get the Cormont Road extension out to Trinity Road, which will bring about another 48 acres on, which Mr. Valray, the owner, is most anxious to end with. Um, we went ahead and filed an environmental assessment. Um, it got appealed, and the province takes their sweet time in, in analyzing those appeals, and they come back and said, we are missing archaeological. We didn't think it was necessary, but we went ahead and did it again, and the same person appealed. So there's one individual out there who just changed the date of letter, files this with the province, and stops the process. And it's been going on now since 2006. And I, I don't know how we can policy change. I know this is province and changing legislation. But they just don't take these frivolous bump-up requests seriously. And, and they just go top of the pile and work their way down. And uh, we're ready to go. The money's been budgeted in 2006. The detailed design was completed last year. I believe it's done uh, now, uh, Mr. Thorne. And, and so that's one area where uh, it's holding up 48 acres that a developer's anxious to move ahead with but can't because of these bump-up requests. The second on the east side of the Ancaster Industrial Park, there's one property owner, a long-time farmer in the area, has decided he doesn't want to develop, and that's certainly his right. But east of, the, of his property is another large chunk of land, and um, uh, Mr. Robichaud and myself met with the owner of that property and with uh, uh, a buyer who's providing a letter of intent to us that he wants to proceed, but he can't because there's no sanitary water. And so we may, we do not expropriate for uh, development. However, we may want to take a look at that policy it relates to just bringing the sanitary, to expropriate an easement to bring the sanitary and the water through. Not do the road, put it right back into agricultural production. But that would open up another large chunk of land that's been sitting idle and zoned uh, industrial for an extended period of time. and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be coming forward once I receive that letter of intent that this investor is serious. And it's about a 40-acre development. It's very significant, if my memory serves me right, uh, to maybe expropriate just to put the sanitary line and the water in to allow the rest of this property to go ahead and develop on the other side because it's a good investor that's coming forward. So those are two policy changes we can look at if, if Council Collins intends to refer this back to staff. What policy changes can we do? There's two significant examples, but through you to Mr. Thorne, do you have a latest update on the Cormont Road extension? Uh, is that still bogged down with the MOE right now, and, and, and is the detailed design now 100% complete? Through the chair, so the uh, yes, it is still sitting with with MOE after this this the second bump up request. Um, as you stated, we we were asked to go back and do some further archaeological work on the on the um, the actual right of way portion across the property. So we did that, resubmitted that. The ministry has all of the information. Um, I'm not aware of any additional requests for information. So as far as I know, they have everything they, they need. Um, and we're waiting on a response from them on the uh, on their decision on the bump-up request. And through you, Mr. Chairman, you've made it very clear to them this is primarily, well, it'd be nice to bring that 48 acres on. It's primarily a health and safety issue because we only have one access to that park with thousands of employees working in there now. Is that correct? Through the chair, yes. That point was very clear in our filing. And they don't seem to be motivated uh, uh, Through the chair, I mean, w w when we speak to them, they understand the urgency, but, but uh, yeah, it has been several weeks now. We haven't seen a, uh, a response back that, that I've seen from Emily. Okay, thank you. And just for clarification, uh, is that a city policy in the appropriation, or is that an actually expropriate, expropriation act that dictates what you can use it for? Because I, I think you were suggesting it was a city policy. Yeah, through the chair, my understanding is that's a, that's a city. Um, I wasn't sure if it was a policy or a practice, but it would, but it was, uh, there, there's no um, uh, legal restriction on us uh, expropriating for, for service. Thank you. This is something I've learned today. Um, can, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, 
Councillor, and uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, congratulations to all. I mean, I think we're, uh, uh, this information is actually uh, uh, not a surprise, uh, you know, it's in terms of the assessment. I mean, I think the, uh, the issue has been and continues to be our commercial industrial growth is uh, improving, um, but we've got a long way to go. <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, when we, we talk about that, it's, uh, it's really all about jobs at the end of the day. Uh, you know, it's also about assessment growth, but it's about jobs in our community, and that, uh, that's one of the bigger issues that we face that we need to address and, uh, and address, uh, you know, with, with hopefully some incentive. So to, to go to the area of looking at our development charges and uh, other incentive programs that uh, will incent the kind of things that we're going to need in the future, and both on the residential side, on the commercial industrial side, I think is going to be critically important. So you're, you made that point earlier. I think it's absolutely where we need to go is, are we getting uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, uptake that, we're, that we should, should be getting in terms of our commercial industrial growth? And are we incenting the kind of residential growth in areas where we are uh, developing our, our nodes and corridors approach in terms of how do we narrow that so that it doesn't become sprawl but becomes intensification? So having said that, uh, a variable rate development charge has been talked about a number of different times, and I think that could be a significant factor in how we evolve that. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how we can uh, employ a variable rate development charge to kind of incent the things that we want and, and actually create a disincentive for the ones that we don't? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it's actually on our outstanding business item list. So staff are looking at the variable rate at the same time as we're looking at uh, specific areas in terms of piloting what the development cost would be in a already developed area versus a greenfield area. So that will be some of the reporting that staff will be coming back to. Uh, it is an outstanding business item list and so uh, we will be reporting back prior to our next development charge bylaw update uh, and I know that staff are looking at uh, the costing and analysis of uh, existing developed area versus greenfield areas. Great, thank you. Uh, very important I think as part of the overall mix of things that we need to look at because it, uh, it could very well kind of lead us towards uh, what I just talked about which is incenting the things we want and creating a disincentive for ones we don't. The tax reassessment issue uh, you know, is, is concerning obviously but I I, I don't want to kind of leave us uh, you know, under the impression that Hamilton is the only community that's facing these kinds of challenges. I mean, I think this is happening across the province. Is that a yeah. pretty accurate so, statement? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, companies are looking to reassess their properties. They're looking for savings in you know, their operations. Uh, we're getting hit by it for sure, and certainly other communities are getting hit by the same issue. Yeah. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, two observations is, uh, in terms of this favorable trend 2014-15 in terms of positive uh, assessment growth in our non-res, uh, it does reflect that we've probably gone through a cycle of appeals, uh, larger appeals, and now we have some greater stability going forward. The other observation is absolutely uh, in terms of across the province, uh, there are certain sectors that are appealing their assessments. Uh, we are very fortunate in the city of Hamilton that we have now a much more diverse economic base. Uh, I look to our partners in Northern Ontario where you have some towns, for instance, that are pulp and paper towns who uh, may be experiencing one appeal, but that appeal may represent a significant portion of their assessment base, maybe 20% of their assessment base. So we're fortunate that we've improved our diversity in terms of the economic base and that is benefiting and that's contributing to this positive non-res assessment uh, figure both in 14 and 15. Thank you for that. So I mean I, I think we've seen the downside I think is the good news and we're probably on the other side of this uh, coming up with more stability in our assessment growth which I think is good news and, and, and an uptick in fact, on the non-residential, commercial, industrial side that uh, we haven't seen in quite some time. I think that's, uh, that's certainly something to be celebrated. Uh, on the, uh, the open for business piece, and I, you know, I, I know we, we talk a lot about that, and we've had uh, kind of updates at our open for business uh, committee meetings, and maybe uh, chair through you to Jason. You know, I, would, I think it would be really helpful for, for this council to get kind of a rolling update as, as we make changes to some of the open for business practices, and, and there have been, been a number of them, and you've talked about them. 
And I know that there's an intent on bringing that a little later on, but I think it would be helpful to get kind of a rolling list so every time we make a change we can add it to the list. And I think this council can realize that we're actually making some uh, significant progress. But you might want to touch on, and I think you did earlier, but maybe touch on again some of the open for business um, process changes that we've made that, that should help speed up uh, the process and, and, and really put us in a position of saying that we're, we're doing everything we can to be uh, ready to accept either new business or, or new growth. Through the chair, yes, at the, at the last Open for Business subcommittee, um, the committee directed us to report back to uh, the committee on sort of a, a summary of some of the actions that have been taken since um, uh, since the initiative really sort of relaunched in about May of last year. Um, so we're working on that report back to subcommittee, and then uh, I believe our direction was the, to then bring it to GIC. Uh, in terms of the rolling updates, um, at, at, the, at present we, were, we provide sort of uh, update memos to the, to the subcommittee when we have made some process changes. Um, but, uh, but with that direction, I, we, we can distribute that more broadly to council as, as we do them. Right now, we're, they're sent through, uh, through subcommittee. Yeah, let me, let me recommend that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're all concerned about being open for business. We all get the complaints in the broader community. Uh, I think it would be helpful that all of council realizes that there are steps being taken and when they happen that they're informed just like the, the committee is informed. So I think that would be, uh, I think that would be very helpful. So thank you for that. Uh, last two pieces, uh, you know, uh, LRT and, and U.S. Steel Lands. Uh, you know, LRT, the whole, the whole point on LRT, as, as we all know, I hope, was to inspire uh, redevelopment and, and intensified growth in the, in the lower city. So we're, we're maybe not seeing it today, but I'm, I have no doubt that we're going to see that in the future. Uh, it is an opportunity for, for a redevelopment. The other side of the coin on the commercial industrial side, I think our imminent opportunity beyond the lands that we already have that uh, may or may not be, uh, that, that are ready to go and are, are being filled up, is the, uh, the the remaining U.S. steel lands behind whatever is left viable on the uh, on the on the U.S. steel uh, capacity itself, and certainly it's an opportunity that uh, I think is uh, is some is one that actually stares us in the face uh, today. It's it's in the mix. We don't know where it's going to land, but I think uh, the work that we're doing with with city manager and others in partnership with uh, the port authority and U.S. Steel ultimately, depending on what their bankruptcy proceeding ends up at, is, is really an imminent opportunity for, for that kind of commercial industrial growth. So uh, not, not that we can foresee exactly what's going to happen, but it's certainly important for us to stay engaged in that process. Last piece is MIP. And I, you know, I've, so refresh my memory, Mike, because I, I know that when we, we invested our $5 million into the MIP uh, project and with great fanfare, and I think for all the right reasons, and I think it's delivering, and slowly but surely, delivering the kind of uh, commercial research that uh, we would all want. There were also a number of uh, commercial components attached to that, strictly commercial components. So hotel, I recall, which has not been delivered uh, on the front end, uh, you know, near Main Street, and a number of other commercials interspersed in the complex over time. So I know, I know that uh, there's concern over the institutional part uh, you know, being reassessed, uh, you know, which is not a great surprise to me, actually. What is a greater surprise to me is that we haven't, uh, haven't seen them put forward those commercial opportunities that which would actually generate a return on revenues or a return on investment that uh, the city of Hamilton hasn't seen just yet in terms of actual commercial industrial dollars. So can you talk a little bit about that to kind of refresh? Because I'm, I'm sure that was the case then. I don't think it's changed. I think it's still in the offing. But don't know when it's going yeah. to land. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm absolutely focusing on assessment benefits, and that doesn't suggest that there aren't economic benefits of the investment. Sure. As it relates to MIP, is there, there absolutely is some commercial activity there. Uh, I think what we're identifying here is there was some sort of an action that triggered some change in assessment. Uh, that action may be a result of a... Uh, a change in use from taxable to, to exempt, either an extension of the education, or it could have come about because of an incorrect assumption from MPAC. Uh, so again, we will report back as to what the details of this uh, change is. Again, the purpose for this slide was just to identify the significant parties that are contributing to the change in commercial and notwithstanding these decreases again overall commercial property uh, assessment is increasing by 0.3 percent 
which is contributing to $0.3 million. And I think that's the positive message is we are seeing some relief as it relates to commercial assessment. I mean, I imagine that uh, there's, there might be some anomaly there because certainly the MIP building is filled with a lot of for-profit businesses, in fact. I mean, some of them are, some of them are uh, you know, uh, uh, fledgling and entrepreneurial kind of coaching uh, uh, areas, the Forge and other places, but a lot of them are for-profit. They're, uh, they're running a regular, uh, you know, small fledgling uh, entrepreneurial businesses out of there that uh, is as, as an incubator and then obviously hoping to grow beyond that. So I, I suspect there's some sort of a top of that, I'm sure. So, so just to, to kind of reiterate, I mean, I think good news today that we have an assessment growth number. Uh, that's, a, that's a positive step. It's trending in the right direction. Uh, the bad news is it's uh, mostly on the residential, but the commercial industrial is growing. And uh, that's a trend I think that we can uh, continue to pursue. And then coming back with some, uh, some policies in terms of how we can further incent that commercial industrial growth I think is going to be very, very helpful. So I think we're, uh, we're, we're actually identifying key issues and coming up with, I think, some, some key solutions going forward. So thank you for all that. Thank you, Councillor Doug Conley. Thank you. Um, going back about two hours, I guess, uh, new housing developments that are going on. And the comment was, uh, <clears throat> new housing does not pay for itself. And I want a little more, a little explanation yes. of that, uh, what you meant by it, or if I misinterpreted you, could you please explain? Yeah. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've reported to Council, I think, in the previous term as we were gathering a response to the province as they were looking at the Development Charge Act, is because of uh, both legislative and discretionary exemption, so there, there are certain forms of development or development within certain zones in the city where those uh, developers are exempt in whole or in part in terms of development charge revenues. And those are revenues that uh, are utilized for funding the servicing that's required for that development. So because of those exemptions uh, and, and because those exemptions are passed on to existing property owners, we know that as it relates to new growth, uh, that new growth does not pay for itself as it relates to the cost of servicing that growth. Council has approved a motion our resolution, it went to the province, that growth should pay for growth. So as it relates to those costs that are being borne as a result of new development, those costs should be recouped or covered through development charge revenues. So again, in terms of my reference, it speaks specific to the cost of servicing new development. And because of those policies, both legislative, provincially legislative policies, and our discretionary or city discretionary policies, those exemptions result in uh, a subsidy in terms of new development. It, uh, excuse me, is that in specific areas? So take for example Upper Stony Creek. There's a lot of development going on there and is it the suggestion is that development does not pay for the infrastructure that's being uh, fired there to that so, so through uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, not specific to uh, Upper Stony Creek uh, in terms of a geographic area, more so in terms of the SEPA, our downtown geographic area, where we have a exemption that is being reduced now over this term of the bylaw. But in terms of, I mentioned previously, in terms of industrial, there are there is some relief to industrial development in that the industrial DC uh, is less than the full cost recovery for industrial development. And as it relates to some commercial industrial expansions, we do have a discretionary policy where we are incenting the expansions. And so those are examples where not to a geographic area, but to certain forms or classes of development, commercial industrial. Well, it keeps coming back to me that why are we doing all those urban spas doesn't pay for itself. And then I hear, well, specific areas in downtown Hamilton that are affected and, and things like that, which, which doesn't come across when people talk about it. They're saying residential and, and they're saying urban residential. 
sprawl. And I keep wondering, we're not paying for ourselves, and I see 88% uh, percent of the tax money coming in. All of the regions that are expanding at Watered water Down and Bimbrook and, and my area and maybe a couple of other ones are bringing in $10 million in tax. And so, and that's $10 million that will be coming in every year uh, in tax, not just a one-time one thing. There must be an advantage to it because if there's not an advantage to building suburban housing, why are we doing it? If it's costing us money, stop it. Why? I'm just trying to find the logic in here. I keep, I keep hearing from other people that, no, you're costing us so much money, you know, policing even is too much. And I get one, one cop uh, up there. <laughs> I don't think I'm breaking the police budget by doing that. So I, I just need explanation, uh, clarification, please. So again, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in terms of the exemptions that we've uh, referred to, those are the examples of the disparity between the cost versus the revenue that, that we've realized. I think what you're seeing in this uh, heat map is one of the benefits of that discretionary policy in terms of the SEPA is, uh, you know, it was a concerted effort by council to try to hope to be able in future year construction activity will result in a deeper tone of green uh, in that area of the city of Hamilton. So again, those are one of those policy decisions that council will have to consider is what is the right level of incentive in order to achieve the outcomes that council is wanting to achieve. Staff have reported in the last DC background study that uh, we are seeing the trends and the outcomes we were hoping to see as it relates to the SEPA. In fact, staff are reviewing that SEPA boundary and are owing uh, a report back. But specific to the costs and revenues, again, as it relates to growth, is uh, there is a disparity between the cost of servicing growth and the revenue we're realizing, partly because of provincial legislation and partly because of our discretionary programs trying to incent development. Simple. Is it worthwhile to do the growth up in these areas of Stony Creek and Bimbrook? Water. Is it worthwhile to the city? Are we? Do we have an advantage? Are we making money? Is our or um, should we cut down on it and, and not do it? And because I understand there's 20,000 20, houses potentially in the next in the future being built on the other side of 20 highway. And why build them all if it's costing us so much money? Yeah. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll start and then Jason can jump in. Just in terms of the ratio is we know that there's going to we're going to need to accommodate future growth in some of these areas where we're realizing growth. And while we're going to continue to see this trend is we're trying to affect and partly because of policies under places to grow and the outcome or the objective of 40% of growth being accommodated through intensification, what we would expect to see is some higher concentrations of development within existing built or developed areas which will re result in a change in pace of development in the suburban areas. But absolutely, the suburban areas will contribute to that development strategy. They will accommodate some of the future growth. That's where the market is uh, demanding. Uh, the village and uh, municipal policies that are trying to align to that target under places of grow around 40% intensification in our developed areas. I'm not sure if Jason wants to add to that. Uh, yeah, through the chair. So, so yeah, so the, the, the provincial growth uh, uh, ratios are 60% of growth accommodated in, in greenfield suburban areas, 40% intensification. Um, I think in, in looking at the um, uh, the revenues from growth, it's um, I suggest that it's important not to lose sight of the fact that um, you know, the home construction industry is also uh, generating about 14,000 direct jobs in the city. 
um, from the housing construction industry. Uh, we also hear a lot from p potential uh, uh, in investors, um, uh, industrial investors, commercial investors. They're looking for places as well where their employees are going to have good places to live. Um, so I know that Neil has done when he's when he's toured investors around. They they, they want to see the industrial parks. They want to see the areas where they might be setting up their businesses. They also want to see the residential areas where the workers they need to attract would live. Um, so I think those are important factors to keep in mind as well when we're looking at some of the economic benefits of some of the um, some of the residential growth um, and some of the, uh, the the home building activity that we see in the city. Can call me? Yeah, I, I'm just trying to get my thought here. I, I tend to agree with what everybody's saying, but I can't hear how much it's costing us, and there's no benefits to it. In fact, I hear a motion coming forward about how much does cops cost us up in the police, how much our fire, how much does, I mean, all I hear is negative, and I don't understand it when, when, 88% of, uh, of the growth this year was in residential areas and not necessarily, obviously not in just mine, but in uh, Brenda's and... Uh, Councillor Connolly, if I can maybe try and help with where you're going, correct me if I'm wrong. You're wrong. The, um, the, the development that uh, Councillor Connolly refers to, so that's the, um, all the growth in suburban or, 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 or mountain areas, and I agree with you that there's always been this criticism they don't pay for themselves. So here's the question. Is there an unfunded liability on life cycle costs and services moving into the future as a result of the funds we're utilizing now? So through, uh, through the chair, in terms of uh, any infrastructure unfunded liability, I don't know that it would be different in those parts of the city versus the existing developed parts of the city. So in terms of how we fund our infrastructure uh, and sustain our infrastructure, we don't have a different policy or process in terms of, of greenfield development. We know that we have an infrastructure deficit and that will continue to grow as our inventory grows. And so again, there'll always be that gap between uh, the level of funding that's required and uh, the cost. But again, specific to greenfield development, it, it does not add a higher level or different level of liability than existing developed areas. Help, oh, Councillor Colling? Yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it go now, and maybe Mike and I can talk and, uh, offline, talk about it a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Mike, um, excellent presentation, timely, and, um, and tremendous valuable information. So thank you very much, uh, Mike. Mike, I'm not rehashing some points, but I just want to throw my oar in the water to reaffirm and reiterate what a number of my colleagues have said. Uh, Innovation Park, very disappointing. I'd like to know who applied your suggesting. I think if I heard you correctly, some exemptions were asked for, whatever, from the commercial component, changing of the use, whatever, which means less revenue to the city. We give $5 million seed money. We got a great partner in the university, and they often come here, like across the road, $20 million, et cetera. All good partnership projects, but I'm very unhappy about this. So. Mr. Deputy Mayor Thuda, Mike, you're coming back with a full report, the genesis of why we're not getting as much revenue from MIP, correct? So, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I can try to capture it in, uh, later this week at our next budget GIC, have a slide. I just want to have the opportunity to review what transpired. I don't want to assume that it was a action taken by MIP. Uh, I want to determine whether or not it might have been an error made in terms of how it was initially assessed and this is a correction versus an action taken by MIP. But again, we can look into that and try to have that information as part of our February 26th update. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, MPAC and the um, appeals, ArcelorMittal, U.S. Steel, Flamborough Downs, I've heard call in the past few years, Lime Ridge Mall now. So, Mike, you, in a very simplistic uh, uh, question, you got great staff. 
Um, sometimes, um, you know, there's specialists out there, ex-cops, who help you successfully fight a speeding ticket. Uh, you got a high fluting case in court, you need the top lawyer. With these appeals, which are impacting us as an old industrial city, the successful appeals against us hurting our bottom line, putting more pressure on the residential side unfairly, are there specialists out there that can help us with the assessment review board and these companies, these large companies, the Cadillac Fairviews, U.S. Steel, Arcelor Mittals, that somehow are getting um, uh, uh, an agreeable, accept, acceptable ear with the assessment review board ruling in favor of them. So I think you, yep. Mike, you got great staff, but sometimes I'm just like our legal department does for an exceptional case. You kind of hire if you can, if it's out there, the best to help us maybe win some of these. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So I want to appreciate the recognition to our staff in terms of the efforts as uh, they apply their skills to try to protect our assessment base. I can advise committee that in the case where we need a specialized support is I have leveraged outside supports to help assist us, ensure us in terms of defending the assessment base. So I, I just want to reassure committee that in the case where we need to supplement or uh, assist our staff that uh, we do not hesitate in uh, making those investments, uh, especially given the potential risk and magnitude of the risk. Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. Um, Mike, slide six, please. Um, so, Mike, we're going along up until slide six, and I was encouraged, excited, and of course, then you bring us back down to earth with slide six and kind of do an ouch uh, reaction. Um, to get to, when you look at this graphic, Mr. Deputy Mayor, from our 13% to, I guess, if you will, the model in southwestern Ontario, uh, Mississauga, 25%, it doesn't seem like that far a gap of only 12%, and you'd think, geez, the Mississaugas of our world uh, surely must be 50-50 between uh, non-res and res. And here they are just at 25%. We're just at 13%. But is that 12% gap much larger than what appears here, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through yeah. you to Mike? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think Chris reported in previous uh, presentations last year, to move that yardstick one yard from 87% uh, to 86%, is it five Canada breads, Gloria? Seven. It would, to move that yardstick one required the equivalent to uh, seven Canada breads. So absolutely in terms of the magnitude of the change, it's very significant. Again, what we're reiterating in terms of our ability to generate revenue is we have a great ability here in terms of generating revenue by realizing a improvement in terms of the trend in commercial and industrial. Okay, thank you, Mike, for that reminder. Um, just through you to Director uh, Neil Everson, please. So, just can I ask you, oh, yep. just the Liberty uh, City Manager. Oh, please, Chris, respond. yes. Just if I can, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. The other fact, I think, Mike, your staff reported was what is the average in Ontario? Yeah. And I think... Um, right there. Yeah, so I, I think that's worth re reminding everyone that the um, the fact is, is, yes, we're above the average, but... Uh, most municipalities are struggling with that balance between non-res and res. Okay, all right. So it's not like uh, everybody's way ahead of the pack here, uh, Chris, and we're just so far behind in terms of the average. So, uh, you know, a little ray in the tunnel at the end of the tunnel there. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to uh, Neil Everson, our Director of Economic Development. Neil, I see uh, to look at this and to help the 13% increase. Neil, just to, um, just to summarize, U.S. steel lands, approximately 800 acres. Airport, about 1,400 acres. Uh, roughly, I'm going to guess in past discussions with you, about 200 acres that will be opened up for uh, commercial manufacturing up in the upper Red Hill Valley Parkway when that's completed about a year from now. So 14,822 plus 2, about 2,400 potential acres. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Neil for future uh, development of non-res. Uh, through Mr. Chair, that, that's a very close approximation, yes. Okay, so that is obviously, thanks Neil, obviously that's, um, those are three areas potentially, Mr. D Mr. Deputy Mayor, that we need to continue to focus on with all the great work that Neil and his team are doing. 
uh, with economic development. Um, lastly, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, look, we're a community of choice. Uh, I've always supported choice. Um, so the res if it wasn't for the residential side of growth, we would hardly have any growth. Um, please don't tell me again about the urban sprawl versus intensification because I'll look around this table and there's colleagues of mine who won't support more than three stories in their particular wards of intensification. So please don't tell me about that, you know, we need to do more of that with the, with the provincial policy paper at the expense of. So I've always been for choice and let's not forget, Mike and Mr. Deputy Mayor, that the spin-offs of our uh, residential growth in the newer areas have resulted in construction jobs, both either for renovation existing and or new build. Uh, how about all the appliances, furniture that are purchased, hopefully mostly in our community. The school, the registration in schools, our library circulations all are increased because of the growth in the residential areas. It overall means a more attraction of our city, which we know we're on everybody's radar today. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I just want to put a bit of a positive spin on the residential growth side. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Aiden Johnson and then myself, and I think we've done the whole gamut with the exception of Councillor Green. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I want to thank uh, Councillor Pearson and Mayor Fred and Councillor Jackson who just spoke for the, the very good questions about MIP. Um, I think that the, the challenge with MIP is essentially a balancing. On the one hand, it's our duty to ask these very necessary questions about return on our city's investment and the other levels of government's investment in MIP. And on the other hand, the other thing we have to balance is recognition that Rome wasn't built in a day. By that, Mr. Deputy Mayor, what I mean is I think it's uh, totally appropriate and necessary to look at investment and a long-term investment. Immediate benefit, uh, and over the past few years, our uh, assessment growth numbers vis MIP, that isn't necessarily a sign that MIP has been a bad investment. And certainly I don't take any of the comments we've heard today as, as suggesting that, but I think it's uh, simply important to say out loud. Another thing that I think is important to remember, re-MIP, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is that assessment growth is not the only indicator of economic value. And I'll look forward to Mike's report about MIP. And it is a very thorny and complicated question. Um, and part of that complexity, of course, is that it's a three-way partnership. At least, you could even argue it's a, when I describe it as a three-way partnership, and primarily our city, but it's also the province and the feds who are taking the side of economic. Two is the university itself, and there's a complicated relationship between MIP itself and McMaster University. So you have the McMaster partner part and the complexities of, of that dialogue between the university and MIP. And then the third partner that I would broadly refer to, which is the private sector and the amazing small startups that are at MIP that in, in many cases, and I know this based on conversations with the entrepreneurs who are there, many of whom have chosen to live in Ward 1 so they can be close to MIP, they're at MIP because the price is right in terms of rent and they would be elsewhere um, if the price were not right. And, it, and they're, they're seeing their businesses grow slowly but surely. And obviously we need to keep them there for the good of the city. And it's a very complicated one. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, continuing that conversation in the future. Um, and I thank you. I'll leave it there. Th cheers. Councillor Johnson? Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask... Uh, um, Councilor Pearson, take the chair, but she's not here, so I'll have to ask the mayor. The, the, um, the last number of years, I've been hitting the, uh, the button. I mean, we've been really focusing on quality of life, but on the revenue side, uh, it's been concerning. Um, whether uh, we talked about fragmented uh, uh, brownfields uh, that are very challenging in regards to optimizing. We talked about under... Uh, serviced or under uh, what's their optimized lands in regards to jobs. We talked about um, obviously um, servicing um, industrial parks where we have uh, some ownership. So th those discussions took several years ago. And now we're fast forward and we're looking at uh, what's being presented. Clearly what actions we have taken on many of those fronts and challenges that we understood 
haven't manifested into greater amount of investment in industrial or commercial. So do we need to review the policies in the last 10 years since they're not bearing the fruit that we hoped for based on these slides? Uh, and again, revisit the challenges, the barriers, the pros and cons, and what other type of um, policy or incentives we need to be looking at. Yeah. Th through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I want to be careful that uh, I'm not mis misinterpreted in terms of what I'm presenting is we are seeing some, some favorable outcomes in terms of commercial industrial. My suggestion was in terms of our programs, our policies, is we should be always recalibrating those policies in terms of what we're hoping to achieve versus what we are able to achieve. And so um, we are going to, you know, across the province, when you look at the economic forecast for the next two years, we know we're going to face some headwinds in terms of uh, development across the province as a whole. So given those challenges is there may be an a opportunity to reconsider our policies and our incentive programs and see whether or not they need to be tweaked or realigned. And it's not just on our commercial industrial. I would suggest in the case of even our residential programs, maybe there needs to be see some realignment or recalibrating of the geographic boundaries for those programs. So again, I would suggest that uh, it's not an exercise that we should be doing every 10 years. It's something that we should be con doing continuously in terms of always measuring the outcomes against uh, what we set out to achieve and our ability to realign or, uh, or better support uh, those programs. I appreciate that. So I guess maybe the question I should be asking then, um, because it gets kind of lost in the, the amount of residential uh, developments taking place here, is that maybe we need now to start looking at um, jobs created in this community in the last uh, three, four years. Uh, we need to look at, and I'm talking about sustainable jobs, I'm talking about uh, commercial and industrial, and, and, and take a look at that growth, and then uh, look at our comparators, determine whether or not it's, we're all you know, sort of moving at the same level, or in fact, we're underperforming based on those comparators. And, and this data doesn't tell me that. Yeah. So, so through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I can tell you that municipalities are gathering data in terms of our previous experiences as it relates to non-residential development uh, under places to grow. I believe the, the target is uh, 50 positions or FTEs per hectare of uh, employment land. And so uh, the, the feedback from municipalities is we are collectively challenged to achieve that target. And so it raises the question of whether it was a realistic target in terms of that level of job density per hectare of uh, employment land or whether that target needs to be revised, revised down What's contributing to those trends in terms of underachieving relative to that target? So, no, I appreciate the planning aspect. I, I, I want to get right down to the brass tacks. How much growth have we had in commercial and industrial relative to our competitors in the last five years? Are we losing ground? Are we gaining ground? Uh, what, what is that benchmarking? So I wouldn't mind seeing a report to that effect so I get a better understanding because, like you said, this uh, really doesn't capture that singular issue, which is really important from an economic, in my mind, from an economic development uh, point of view to understand uh, whether we're getting the job done. Okay. Mike, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Just through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we can report back as we report back through the tax competitiveness transpired in Hamilton versus our competitors. Yep. Thank you. The, um, Councilor Pearson mentioned the heads and beds, and, uh, and I don't need to revisit the fact that the province hasn't changed since the 70s and it needs to be addressed. But so having said that, it's a separate issue. For the purposes of this discussion, we had over a billion dollar investment uh, done between Mohawk College and St. Joe's at uh, Fennel and, uh, and Garth. I gotta think, I gotta think that we've in, there's been increased revenue coming from both of those uh, institutions through the heads and beds, where's that cash? 
captured. Yep. So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, absolutely. In terms of our corporate financials, and I can bring this information to the attention of, of uh, committee, I'll send this information out, is uh, I reported on payments in lieu of taxes. And so there has been some favorable trends in terms of the payment in lieu of taxes. I think what Councillor Pearson was identifying in terms of the gap between the payment in lieu of taxes relative to if they were assessed at market value, whether it's commercial or industrial. Uh, so that's where there is a disparity or a gap. And so it really represents a foregone revenue so to Mr. the Mayor, I'm acknowledging that. That's why yeah. you want to get into that debate. What I want to know, though, is that uh, where do I find the numbers since uh, those are fully occupied, functional, clearly there's a, a, an expansion that needs to be counted for in regards to the heads and beds. What is that number? Because I haven't seen it. So through you, Mr. Mayor, it was part of my uh, corporate financial presentation, and I will uh, provide committee with that breakdown. And again, I'm assuming it's captured in that number. Sometimes there's a lag in terms of when that gets captured on the rolls, but assuming it's captured, uh, we will identify to committee members what that value is in terms of that particular development. You'll confirm whether yeah. we're still in the lag period or it's now captured. And I need to clarify, I said 40 years. It's beds has been revised. Thank you. Okay. I guess the other question, um, where, because, and I think you've identified, you want to see um, more residential built in the lower city and clearly what's happening right now, that's, we're not there yet through this, the assessment uh, that you've captured to date. The reason for it though is that um, we're told that um, if you get, have greater density in areas that already have services, there's a, um, a greater value to the taxpayers on the long run for that type of development. Is that true? So through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is the analysis that staff are currently compiling is what is the cost of, what is the forecast cost of development in existing developed areas and relative to what we assume in terms of the development charges. So again, if the, just to illustrate, if the analysis reports back that there is a cost but it is half of the cost that we assume across the city as a whole, that may provide some consideration for a variable rate as the mayor's identified. Some municipalities have a, a variable rate in terms of development charges, whereby there's a lower rate of development charge in existing developed areas versus greenfields. I would assume that we're already come to that conclusion because we've waived development charges in certain areas in the downtown because we see it uh, as a low cost value added uh, investment in that area. So if we're already subscribing to that philosophy, well, and I'm not disputing or suggesting that's a wrong philosophy, I guess where I'm having trouble though is when I look at the type of growth that's taking place that's been demonstrated in these, uh, these documents. Um, they're mostly single family and, 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 uh, and, and, and townhouses and they're not um, uh, places of density. So I'm trying to reconcile my own mind how if in fact we've determined uh, where the best value is to encourage and incentivize density. I can give you examples where we're just doing the opposite therefore not realizing uh, the greater value that we've already demonstrated through removing development charges in certain areas. So I'm going to ask this question directly to the mayor, to Jason Thorne, who knows I'm t what I'm talking about. <laughs> Mr. Thorne. So, so through the chair, or through the mayor, um, so the, uh, in, in terms of the, 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 the attracting growth to the downtown, um, I mean, that was one of the the, the council identified priorities in doing the, the new official plan is that if the growth could be accommodating through intensification, um, a certain amount was allocated to the downtown core, a certain amount to the uh, to the to the corridors, and to the, and then a certain amount to the other nodes in the cities. So the the um, intent behind the CIP incentive programs is to sort of bridge that gap between um, what the what the market is able to bear in terms of uh, uh, attracting development into the downtown development take place. Uh, what Mike's speaking to in terms of the Servicing work that's being done uh, coming out of the 
services. Uh, there are, um, you know, it, it varies block by block. In just trying to take a finer grain look at the broad downtown area, which is a really large area. And in that area, are there are there blocks that are than others? Um, and have that then do our intensification policies um, a little more surgically, a little more strategically in, in the downtown core. So that's the piece of work that we're working on right now um, to come along with the uh, uh, the next DC bylaw update so that council can make a decision in terms of whether it wants to continue with a, um, a blanket exemption for the entire downtown area or what's been suggested as a, a more variable approach where it may be more nuanced with, with, with different DC exemptions in different parts of the downtown or different parts of, of, of the city. Okay, so help me understand this, because it seems to me, and I, I, it, there's a struggle, that uh, smart development is that you get greater value from, and then I'm getting forcefulness as we're getting that reaps the best return on the long term in a community. The basis for those policies in the OP are directing growth to areas where um, we're, we're talking these we tend to be talking more about some of the hard infrastructure services but also services um, where the access to um, to recreational this is where the, where the basis for the OP would it not for the higher density within the urban through the chair yes and, and I think that's why, why why the OP and the various various secondary plans direct the higher density development to those nodes and corridors so I guess uh, medium density for example so we do have policies that come with what we're trying to achieve. Through the mayor, I'm not, I'm not through some of the medium density green, uh, uh, greenfield developments. I think where council has made some changes um, going back about four months now is specifically to the high density category, um, greater than I believe it was 300 units per hectare, um, put a cap on those rates. Um, and also in, on, on, in some of the older urban areas, um, recognizing that that was an, was an area of that, uh, that council wanted to address as well. So for the, the highest density category, um, those parkland dedication caps have now been put in place on an interim basis subject to the full review of the parkland dedication bylaw. Councillor. Okay, well, I guess my, my, my concern is um, I, with the largest population in the figure out when the last time a high rise has been built there, provide the business case for them to do that. Through the chair, so the parkland dedication cap on, on, high, on the highest density category applies wide. Um, so regardless of where those projects are, um, the DC exemptions would be specific to the Our policies across not just development uh, needs to be reviewed with whatever geographic area of the city and we have that continuity or consistency. I'm going to put forward a motion to actually wanting to, to uh, look at just for Mike's benefit, you know, Mike a long time. So, and you've got, you've got a ways to go yeah. for you to be standing and all of us to be on those assessments I think uh, was uh, um, we later they're for-profit they're running a business and yet they're exempted for their operation where everyone else has to pay uh, the fair share whether it's in their lease or otherwise for their uh, taxes so help me understand that 
So through the uh, through the mayor, we'll provide that update in terms of why they've transitioned from uh, to exemption. And uh, again, it may be that it was it's been deemed an extension of uh, the learning or education uh, component of McMaster. But again, we'll provide that detail. I'm just speculating at this point. Okay, um, those are all my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I uh, have no further speakers on a list. No one else. No, no one else has indicated, and I do believe that Councillor yes, Collins I have has that. a motion. Councillor, so we have Councillor Collins and Councillor Brill have a number of motions. Uh, I'll first, go to Councillor Collins. Sorry, let's do that. Move by Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Green. If it had programs, and that. Any votes carried. Council Collins, that concludes your motions. Council Merla. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Let's move by myself and seconded by Council Collins that staff be directed to assess uh, the actual net gain or loss um, related to residential tax. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none. Council Collins. Uh, Nation. Uh, uh, exactly what you were talking about the residential um, taxes and what the actual net gain is or net loss of providing 260 services per residential or residential system. Oh, are you talking about uh, through the chair? Individual areas like uh, water down and no, no, just, because just, when you take the whole complex of it and conclude the downtown and all the exemptions they get, it makes the other part look bad. No, it's just urban versus rural. That's it. For every what? Urban versus Urban. rural. That's okay. it. So, and, and you mentioned, I'm sorry, you mentioned before that you wanted to talk about police services, fire, and yeah, all I don't know, whatever. Every, every, every aspect of a community. So, you, so you've got to talk about individual communities if you're going to talk about that. You're going to because the police services vary significantly depending on where in the city you live. So well, police, police is an area rated. There will be area rating included, but police isn't That's area not rated. area rated. No, that's my but point. You mentioned that's police, that's why I'm asking. So let's not have a cross debate. Thank you. To go to the chair, you mentioned, you mentioned police in your talk. Just overall, um, in overall that's, yeah, for every dollar that we collect, in taxes, how much are we paying out in providing services versus that of commercial and industrial? And I think, Mike, uh, you can elaborate on this again. Yeah. yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, we'll try to uh, estimate what the cost is and what the benefit of those different forms of development are. So again, the utilization of municipal services would differ by residential developers or residential development in terms of residents versus commercial industrial. So again, commercial industrial may not access to the same degree social services, health services, recreation services as an example. And we'll try to differentiate between the utilization of those services by the forms of development. So, Councilor Pearson, can I have you take the chair? Yeah. Caveat, because I'm not clear if Motions lining up with what you're suggesting. So, um, in new development, say rule of development, um, they, and we've already got the numbers, they would be contributing $10 million, and their life cycle of the roads is 25 years. So, for 25 years, there's going to be a contribution on the capital side that we won't be necessarily spending in those communities because uh, they're very new uh, uh, development. And that, those, that 25 years of of that contribution, how do you calculate that into this assessment? So through the chair, uh, we'll have to look, for instance, I think what the uh, Councillor White has identifying is in terms of the pace of development versus the collections. So again, we can look at our background study, which identifies specific projects with related costs and the timing of those. So again, I appreciate what the Councillor is wanting to, uh, for staff to report back on and we'll do our best in terms of trying to assess the draw on services of different forms of development and we may need to uh, include some general discussion around the economic and beyond just property. Tax. 
Appreciate it. That's, I'll take the chair back. Carried. Councilor Merlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Collins and staff and report of businesses who change their assessment of locating their business to by Councilor Farr, the staff be directed to investigate where there may be um, service. Okay. Do you have a question, Colin? Well, what short term is what? Five years? Ten years? Two years? Jason? Six months? Be serviced. Uh, if it's serviced, then it's going to be it's going to be going. Yeah. That's what I'm going to have is property that's zoned. When exit uh, interview with this community and their reasons for leasing, you walked away. That's part of it. So, so that's part cool. of it. So that clarification is provided. I don't see any other motions. Do I let this motion be dealt with? Thank you. Discussion on the motion.
I'm on time. So if we can get everyone sit down. as it relates to MIP. So I can give you a verbal update. It's MIP as to what trend. 15, 
You'll recall the former Camco warehouse that was at the back end of that MIP facility was utilized in part for retail. It was uh, the reference port and it was used for hosting retail activities. It was taxed uh, as, I believe, commercial. $90,000 annually. What transpired in 2015 was it was occupied for the um, for the research work that is being supported by McMaster. So that was what triggered the change. Uh, and again, the materiality. Uh, an update in terms of what transpired. You know, a little bit in, in awkward um, on this particular deal, and not just this, the other ones that are happening. Being through what should be justifiable taxation based on assessment process. So today uh, you've received the assessment presentation and you have the staff report as part of the agenda. Uh, staff have uh, further relief in terms of our current position of 2.1. There were some referred items that we'll be reporting back on uh, this afternoon. That leaves in terms of budget GICs, we have a uh, 15 year end variance. Uh, so, again, staff are compiled. Relates to a shelter. Staff report uh, the recommendations to allow committee to schedule that aligns a council's objective in terms of accelerating the budget process. If on March 9th. Absolute joke. I just want to go on the record and say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are some limited service level impacts. Uh, I should also point out as it relates specifically to the public health services reductions, there are uh, further reductions in FDEs of approximately 1.15 FDEs. So if, if approved, specifically the public health uh, amendments would further reduce our FDEs by 1.15. So you'll recall we started the budget process, I believe, with 5.2 uh, FDEs reduction. This would further reduce that to about uh, six and a half FDEs. Yes. So in terms of the amendments, public health again, it uh, assumes the reduction of 1.5. So again, I can go through. Further expand, or we can move on. Sorry, it's up there. No, we do have some people on the. Uh, the okay, so I do have uh, Council. Slow numbers versus their previous. Second adjustment is you'll recall. client costs is the province will be lost by 2018. What we put before you, this, the $184,000 reading for today, if it results in a year end and 17. So again, overhaul.
uh, committee consider moving these and approving these amendments? Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Mike, as always, thank you to the corporate SMT for the further re-review that uh, every budget usually brings us some additional savings uh, halfway through. So thank you for this slide. I want to uh, just highlight two role uh, Dr. Richardson. I know Liz for several budgets here of the MOH and two or three associate medical officers of health and is there opportunities to merge, amalgamate, uh, to provide some savings and so I'm seeing this as a positive and you're taking under advisement and responding to my request and I'm not alone in looking at that. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to Dr. Richardson, have I accurately assessed this and thank you for the savings? Uh, Deputy Mayor, that's correct. As we stepped back and said, were there ways that we could make changes related to this? So Dr. Emily, um, at the beginning of 2015, looked at the medical director role within the sexual health clinic and looked at ways they could change the, uh, the work and make it doable, complement of just the associate medical officers. And so that's been done. It worked uh, during the course of that year, and so we were able to put it forward as part of the 2016 budget process. Uh, uh, a very sincere and simple thank you for that. On the dental services, two-thirds of the way down, um, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Dr. Liz, I just want to make sure the one-year pilot at McCassa Lodge that hopefully after its success might spread elsewhere, I just want to make sure that that is not impacting that. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Dr. Richardson. Deputy Mayor, yes, thanks for the opportunity to clarify on the dental services one in particular because at the uh, at the departmental budget pre presentation, I'd commented that there were anticipated changes still in terms of the HSO transition. So that's the children's dental services piece that's being transitioned. And there may be some opportunities with the seniors dental program that we had. So this um, is just about the HSO transition. And it's just a function of, as we've understood more and more about what the province is actually willing to fund 100%, we've put in more and more uh, requests to them to fund those 100%. And so there's some risk associated with this one because we still don't have uh, full clarity and we'll get budget approvals from them this coming year. But, uh, but we've put in what we really think is, is part of that programming and should be paid for by the province. And just to clarify on the seniors program itself, that program, the MACASA piece, is going forward, the pilot that we had talked about. And as we stepped back and looked a little further at the details and the, the statistics of what's been going on in that program and other programs across the city, we still think there's a lot of work to do to decide how best to meet. So we're going to continue. MACASA, but I suspect it's going to be such a success for seniors and the frail elderly that it'll be, um, it'll be expanded to many parts of our uh, community where many members of council have also advocated for seniors. So, Dr. Liz, thank you for the merging of the 63,000 and appreciate the reaffirmation of the seniors program. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Happy to second what's before us, slide three. Uh, I think the mayor wants to move it. I'm happy. I have a quick question regarding revenue generation. You said, Mike, uh, through you, this is the first First year, you're able to budget it. I assume in uh, subsequent years, it'll just get easier. Uh, so through you, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure that it'll be easier because I don't want to set expectations, but absolutely uh, staff feel comfortable with the 400,000 and we're hoping to overachieve on that 400,000 for 2016 and allow for some further reductions entering into 2017. Okay, I ask because isn't there an element there where we're trying to generate revenue uh, over long-term sort of marketing contracts and deals. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, absolutely, but also around our investments, you'll recall that uh, revenue generation in uh, collaboration with our investments group have identified a, and it's important, that this 400000 the forecast is a revenue, again, that would fluctuate in future in future years. So again, we as staff are comfortable with. So I don't have any other speakers at this point in time, so I'm going to ask uh, the mayor to move it and second by Councillor Farr. Having further discussions, all those in favor? Carried. Any opposed, carried.
Thanks, so Michael. through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I want to thank staff for compiling that uh, list of further reductions because you'll see in this table as we started the uh, budget process uh, in January, December, January with the printing budget books at 20, just short of $28 million in pressures or 2.3%. There were some further amendments uh, that were presented in February, February 12th that reduced it from 2.3 to 2.1 and based on this list of uh, amendments, we're now at 1.9%. Uh, in terms of uh, the assessment growth information I just presented this morning, I identified that we have some further relief as a result of the 1.6 relative to the 1.3 that we assumed. So part of that, uh, part of the 1.5% or 0.5% there is the 0.3 from the positive assessment growth. Adding to that for a total of 0.5 is, you'll recall as a result of the last reassessment period, is there was some relief to, or to residential, commercial, industrial in that their assessment growth did, was not at the same level or pace. So in terms of residential, as a result of reassessment, not to be confused, I apologize, I'm not trying to confuse it with assessment growth. So of that 0 0.5, 0 0.3 is assessment growth. 0.2 is, res, is relief as a result of reassessment for residential. So what we have is a total of 0.5% and further uh, relief for residential uh, taxpayers as a result of assessment growth and uh, reassessment. I think Councillor Collins asked the question last GIC in terms of education. The provincial budget's released on Thursday uh, of this week. Uh, we've assumed that there'll be no increase in terms of the education portion of the property tax bill. If that changes on Thursday, I will come back on Friday to advise of that. Our initial assessment is based on previous practice. There's a low risk of that. So if the province continues with its previous practice of not increasing the education portion, and because of the rate of assessment growth in Hamilton relative to the provincial average, the fact that we're slightly lower, we're provided some education relief. That education relief amounts to a further 0.2%. So again, started today, we're at 2.1. With the staff amendments, that brought us to 1.9. With the assessment growth, and some reassessment benefits. And finally, with the education relief, I'm happy to report we're at 1.2% on the residential. That 1.2% excludes the referred items. So that 1.2% translates into a $46 impact for an average assessed property now of 295,000. So this is the first update I have to you in terms of that average assessed property. Last year was 284.6, and now uh, we're reporting 295,300 as the average. And we'll come back in our tax policies with each of the former municipalities and wards. So a few areas I want to focus on in terms of this, this uh, table. Council's guideline to staff was 1% going into the 2016 budget. Our city departmental budgets are going up by 0.7. If I compare that 0.7 to the average of the previous four years, our previous four year average was 0.62%. So staff have achieved departmental increases well below inflation and below the 1% target in terms of uh, the 2016 budget process. So if you look at the departmental our capital financing, so this is uh, Council's effort to address our, A, our infrastructure deficit, as well as those strategic objectives such as parkland acquisition, waterfront, and beyond those is we've also accommodated some targeted investments in our capital budget that was approved by Council uh, in terms of housing, lodges, and roads. So again, in terms of that 0.5%, not only were it, were be, sorry, were we able to make some 
improvements in terms of the infrastructure, we've been able to support uh, those areas of investments. So again, in total, uh, at the municipal level, we're at 1.4% with the 0.2% relief in terms of education, that brings us to 1.2% or $46 for an average household. Michael, is there a reason why you, did you fold police services into the boards and agencies? Yes, so uh, through, through uh, the chair, in terms of boards and agencies, it includes uh, conservation authorities, Hamilton Public Library, and uh, Hamilton Police Services. So again, you'll recall that Hamilton Police Services, the increase was 2.95%, uh, and that's captured in that 0.3% or $10. So it's higher than the, the city departments, the average of the board and agencies, and the capital finance? So through the chair, it is higher than the city departmental increase. So again, we're at 1.2% exclusive of referred items, 1.4% uh, in terms of the municipal taxes. So again, education is contributing 0.2% relief, but for comparison purposes to be consistent with what we presented in the past, we've compared our municipal taxes to our comparators. So where, where do we stand today? At 1.4%, you'll see that we stand now in terms of our comparators on the low side, well below the average, again, exclusive of the referred items. Uh, but in terms of the referred items, uh, again, we're at 1.2%. The referred items would represent probably an additional 0.7% if all approved. And that would put us at 1.9%, again, to the low side of our comparator group. So again, a very favorable uh, outcome in terms of making investments while balancing with tax competitiveness, uh, council's objectives, uh, and preserving service levels in terms of our 2016 preliminary budget. There was a request at our last GIC in terms of housing specifically. What's reflected in our 2016 budget as it relates to housing, Council approved through the 2016 capital budget $3.8 million for housing. And you can see the breakdown in terms of housing services, $1.5 million and city housing, Hamilton, $2.3 million. So I'm gonna pause here in terms of the sustainability of that commitment. Part of the financing strategy to assist in this level of investment in 2016 included a reliance on capital financing surpluses in 2015. You're gonna hear from me on Friday, an update in terms of our year-end forecast. So part of the funding for housing, lodges, and roads, we were borrowing from 2015 capital surpluses. That is not sustainable. And if you look at our 10-year forecast, you'll see that housing uh, reverts back to the historical level of investment of approximately a million dollars. So I wanna identify, while we're able to achieve this level of investment in 2015, going forward, we will be challenged without considering greater debt or reliance on other revenues. So I just wanna further um, identify how we achieved this level of investment in 2016. In 2016, on the operating side, housing represents about $55 million net, and that represents an increase of approximately $2.4 million over and above the uh, approved budget in 2015. And the final uh, piece is the housing allowance that will be before you in the referred items on an annualized basis that represents $1.1 million in 2016, recognizing we're part of the balance of the year, it's $825,000. So this was a piece of information that committee requested at our last GIC that we come back with the information. So that represents the end of the update. So again, uh, we're in a very favorable position, exclusive of referred items of 1.2%, and what you'll see in the balance of uh, the presentation today are the referred items. I believe one of the referred items, item 11, which is the AODA item, uh, we 
been asked to report back on Friday as it relates to a revised costing for that. So again, that, that item we will be bringing back on Friday, but the rest of the referred items are before committee for your consideration today. Michael, Councillor Collins. Just to be clear, so I, I certainly understand the whole context of the enhancements and the current operating budget after we've gone through all operating departments. So 1.9, but to be clear, I just want to be certain in terms of how the provincial budget will affect the education tax rate. Mike, if you can yeah. go through that again. So um, if, if through you, they, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've assumed no change in uh, the provincial education tax rate. If that changes, if there's an increase, I would have to come back on Friday and advise that we may not be a 1.9 to possibly a 2.1? Uh, change the rate? Or yeah. Well, would it be through you, Mr. Deputy that? Mayor, that may be a worst case. Councillor Jackson. Because yes. what will happen after yes. this particular slide, I... Mike, before we get to refreshing our memory on what advanced in the last meeting on the referred items if the ones that advanced after we so, uh, three if as presented yes. if all the referred items were to be approved if yes. it is that committee referred the a a darts referred item which represented a pressure of 2.1 million yes back to staff to report back on friday the 1.1 million which is what mr dixon's recommending it would be an additional point which would take 1.9 then. Yes. Eleven being revised from 2.1 to something less, if a million would alleviate. I understand that because we're, we're getting to the finish line here, and I just wanted to understand. It. Warren and or manager Sue Monarch in terms of how they're going to raise money. Constituents contact me, say, Tom, don't support that. It's interesting. I just want to make a comment. I have, so asking through you to General Manager Thorne, Jason, I'm not on for the names in the future, those kind of things to our community. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through so through the chair, um, currently the, the tourism is living entire for reserves um, and the, the annual have been utilizing. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to uh, Jason. Through the chair, that's correct. At 150, we would be able to maintain status quo level of activity uh, without reserves. Seven. Seven. Currently, today, no. Nope. Combine with the rest of my colleagues. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Staff is here, um, and um, Sue Marner, could you just explain when you, just for the committee and viewing, put bids in for for different um, events? Because I know it costs for the band. So could you just explain exactly? say, hey, come. What we do is it goes directly back into, right into Hamilton. But it is all part of the process. And I'm looking at a list here right now, and counting CCMAs, which we think we very much are moving forward. Really, really excellent work, our staff. Group needs 150,000. Um, the 350 represents uh, uh, an enhancement to the current level of service. Back to what it, more what it feel comfortable in moving with 150,000 um, dollar. 
um, will help us to remain sustainable is barely taking us back in two years' time. Uh, we should be fine, but um, we'll have no reserves, and it should have nowhere to go. So, or we'd be not Otherwise, as I say, we're going to, you know, and this takes specific tourism strategy field of um, streamlining our FTEs and got ourselves to where we're sustainable. But to get back to that 1.4, answer 150, but the 50 over the next few years certainly will put the support we're seeing um, in the industry where they'll be operating their own funding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the long, short answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get um, list. You're going to see areas that are worthy, but are all uh, is quality of life. It's not generating revenue to offset some of the quality of life issues. One that actually is about for those quality issues that are so dear and important. To us, so you pound foolish in the sense that why would we make an investment? We heard a pretty uh, 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 challenges and the fact that they have to compete and they can't compete with one hand tied behind their back. We also heard from the hospitality industry that they're prepared uh, to to put a surcharge on their rooms to again supplement to get sporting events, con conventions, and all those other things that make community successful and brings revenue, and I want to make this clear, brings new revenue into the community, which is about creating wealth. So from that perspective, this is the only one, I think, on this list that's actually about generating revenue on the long term. So I would only suggest to my colleagues, um, we need to keep this alive uh, till the end, and then we'll have a, that robust debate. So I will be certainly supporting what's before us today. Those are my comments. I'll take the chair back. Councilor Farr. Through you, just to see real quick. Uh, so, so if we go with the 150 as being suggested, I think moved by Councilor uh, Jackson, and you've said you could live with it, um, you'll still, between now and our next budget cycle, be able to come before us as, a, as an elected body to um, present what may come along between now and then, as you have in the past, as it relates to major your events uh, that weren't just monetary asks, they were in-kind asks uh, for participation in these major events. Is that is that fair to say? Most definitely. I'll give you an example. No better one than the uh, 2015 Juno Awards. Um, we certainly were able, through council support, a $250,000 investment, but we were able to go to the province and get $1.25 million to bring that event in here. But that doesn't even touch on the in-kind and in kind to make it happen. So I mean, is very comprehensive. We didn't come back to council for one, one bit of operating dollars on that one. So I, I think what we're doing is exactly what the mandate is. And a, a lot of these events we're bringing these, um, you know, Kiwanis next year, American Public Gardens in uh, 2015 is 1,700 people coming in. States, um, you know, so and we're on their host committee. These events and it uh, it, it takes some uh, upfront resources. I think that's an important part of their budget. But, uh, Mr. Chair, these are these are. Uh, I mean, I'll support the uh, the. That the staff come back long before about future years, because I think that's uh, that just included in the operating budget enhancement. There's been a few over the years. I just never the operating budget to begin with. 
captured as a referred item. There was a staff to the budget process, to the 2016 budget process. So why it's before further consideration. Okay. And most of it was, was staff. is why we need the increase and it just okay. and I appreciate that the staff had referred hands held out saying you know we need for that for that department to operate I just don't understand why it's not in the operating budget to begin with so uh, through you mr. deputy mayor in the past we've captured similar uh, examples where the issue change in the level of funding support so as it relates to this specific issue there's two changes one is the level of provincial support is affecting the ask as well as a recommendation that uh, it uh, be financed from levy instead of reserve so for those two reasons in the past it's come before committee as an enhancement or a referred item okay and I and, and thanks for that I guess I'm just looking at, say, for instance, Public Works when they come through and say, "Sorry, we had to have for an increase because the gas pumps are higher." So it's almost like if, if it's an operating object, then, anyways, thanks, Mike, for your answers. Thank you. Uh, seeing none, I'll go back to Kevin Jackson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, with all the things to sue Monarch Energy staff, and if we even start with my moving $150,000 today. That's a start to get back. This year, next year, there may be no breathing room and whatever commitments you suggest uh, or commitments you suggest and they're pursuing a tax on their customers. That's not a pot for us to use. They will be collecting. Or be any dollars that are in. That in. Um, through you, Mr. Deputy, actually getting us back to where we um, we could have 2016 sell two more conferences. Be you know, um, uh, Canadian Country Music Awards will be 250 thousand. I know that for a fact. So it's just about the, with more success, we're going to have to do these bid incentives. We're going to have to do the, the increased marketing. We're going to have to do the convention building, which is one of the most critical things that we're not been able to do. If you're bringing an American Public Gardens Association into Hamilton next year with the possible 1,700 um, Americans coming in, they need to know about Hamilton. We need to go the year before. These are some of the 
budget items. But I, I do want to emphasize that um, it's also about making the reserves sustainable as well. We're so not into just spending the money for the sake of the money. If we don't use it all with the incentives, we will be transferring that money into the reserves for the next year. So right now we've drained those reserves. This is a way of getting back in business, doing the incentives, and then also keeping us sustainable because it's like emptying your savings account eventually. There's nothing there. Right, so. Thank you, and I appreciate that information, Sue. Um, so I just also ask then, um, need to top it up. So we said 150000 this year. You still may have to tap in the Country Music Awards. That's a large dollar item. Even if we approve this, you still may be coming back to us, cap in hand, saying, you know, what, we don't have enough to do this. Is this a scenario that we still could be faced with, correct? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes. That's ex that is exactly some of these are big ticket items and you know significant return on investment. But we may have to come each and every time to say you know we don't have the twenty five or thirty thousand or the hundred thousand. Um, it's just all part of you know how to bring this business in. So yes, we we may have to come with individual requests. And would there be concerns with time timing issues if that was on specific items? Um, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it's always an issue because it's quick turn around these bid proposals. So yes, there are timing that we, we certainly would be walking stuff on as quickly as we possibly could. So yes, timing is how we... And the environment that they appreciate, um, I would prefer to say have them come cap in hand. Well, you know what, we need another quarter of a million because now we're going after the CEC. So I, I, um, I may be standing by the 350000 as the original ask. Thank you. That was uh, uh, side presentation. So the industry to revenue, not supplementing um, our budgets, but to have a synergy in what we're trying to achieve for the community. Would that be a correct way of saying that? To you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So none of the DMP funding will be used to fund the City of Hamilton Tourism Hamilton's budget. Rather, the DMP funds will supplement select projects in, and, and invest with Tourism Hamilton. These particular projects will align with the goals of the steering committee that they set up. So their goals right now are attracting more meetings, more conventions, sport tourism events, major events like the Junos and the Canadian Country Music Awards. And just to also embellish in on this, the tax is one thing, but these partners do pay to play. I, I really want it known that if we go to CSAE and we're at a major trade show, they do cost share with us. So they are opening their own pockets and, you know, obviously they're collecting a tremendous amount of tax dollars and putting it into the levy. But this isn't just about that the, the industry standards, which is this DMP. They are also supporting in the same way that if we go to a conference, we're paying our share. If Rancor goes, they pay their share of Carmen's they pay their share so they you know they aren't just having someone else pay they are certainly working with us as it is now so uh, in the presentation so I, I want to make it clear that all the presentations I've heard you are competing it's a very competitive industry you would you would acknowledge that through the chair Yes, through um, Mr. Deputy, or through the chair. Um, we're, we're facing um, the Windsors, the Londons, everyone that is, you know, the DMPs are becoming an industry standard. They are a best practice. And so when we go in, we're going against competitive communities like London, um, you know, Windsor. And if you're not walking into the room in the same, you know, we analyze what would be, we do past history, we check and see um, what a previous conference was, what the previous community put in, how it was put in, and so when we do go with these bids, we we either put the dollars in or we're knocked out before we ever walk in. And and again, those dollars do not leave this community. They are they go to offset the meeting costs, the facility costs of city owned facilities. That is the only place this money goes. So it would be meeting space or Iverwind Stadium, you know, an arena for one of the major tournaments. That's how the dollars are dispersed. So what I wanted to focus on though is 
you're competing currently with many communities that already have hospitality type taxes in their communities that are doing their own thing in those communities. The only difference now is you've had our own hospitality industry come up and say, we're going to step up the plate and help you compete, but uh, you're still playing uh, behind the eight ball if you don't have appropriate funding to do your part. Absolutely true, Mr. Uh, um, Deputy. That is, I'm through the chair. That is correct. Thank you. Those are my questions. And uh, you can add Councillor Jackson to your list, please. I think you had Councillor Merla next. Councillor Merla. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, oh, Councillor Jackson asked you, is 150 sufficient for you to operate in 2016? Are you... Through, yes, we can by using our reserves as, as is. We still may have to tap into our reserves to be able to do to continue to do business and to move it forward the way we need to move it forward. So we're recognizing the limitations you have as a council, but we can sustain it, but we may have to continue. We likely will have to continue to drain our reserves. Okay, so we do have an opportunity to defer the issue without any impact on, on the program itself and review it uh, in a year's time, which I think is a prudent blessing. I want to thank Councillor Jackson for that prudent means that he's offering. Uh, I'm not sure why we're uptight about it, so I, I, I look forward to supporting Councillor Jackson on this motion. Thank you. I believe that's all the first time speakers. And Councillor Jackson, seconding. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Marilla. So, through you to General Manager Thorne, where I started uh, 20 minutes ago. General Manager Thorne, you said $150,000 is what you currently pull out of reserve, correct? Through the chair, so 150 is, is, is currently what we do on, a, on, a, on an average basis status quo. Um, where we have to go into reserves beyond that is if there are if there's large, larger items that we're pursuing. Um, but on an average basis, if we, if we don't do any additional level of activity, um, then 150 is what our status quo is. Okay, thank you. Secondly, was this originally this 350? I think this has been lost in the equation. Was this 350 originally provincial funds, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to either Sue or Jason? I the, heard somebody say it the was 350 provincial funding. Was a, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy, uh, we were funded uh, 350000 a year by the province. In 2011, they decided to suspend that, and in 2012, it was the last year. That's why we moved forward with the tourism strategy to really understand what our market was, and we tried to maintain um, status quo for the last three years using our reserves. So, yes, it was 350000 that everyone across the province lost funding from the provincial government. Thank you, Sue. So, Councillor Marula's regular comment about downloading 350000 of provincial funding that was lost to our municipality for this area of tourism. I haven't heard one of my colleagues screaming about, let's go to the province to get that funding back, because tourism is good for Hamilton, it's good for the province of Ontario. So, lastly, when the delegation came in last week from the private industry, I asked the question of the main presenter, uh, can you give us a feel for what you think we should be supporting our own internal department? And to paraphrase, he basically said, Councillor, that'll be up to you and Council to decide whatever measure amount you give. You know, we'll leave that up to you. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with all that in mind, I think this is a start to get back to where they were with former, formal, former provincial dollars that have evaporated three years ago. So I stand by my 150. Thank you. Thank you. I have no further speakers. So um, the motion is duly put on the table to reduce the 350 asked to 150. All those in favor? All those opposed? Councillor um, Connolly, Councillor Pearson, and myself. I refer the balance to next year's budget discussion. Councillor Collins refers to the balance of this discussion to the 2017 budget deliberations. Uh, second by Councillor Ferguson. Uh, any further discussion on that? All those in favour? Any opposed? Carry. I, I got the amendment, but are we moving the motion as amended today? Mike's request was that well, we actually it, start to approve these today. So got the amendment to reduce well, it. Well, I think Mike also indicated that there's more information in regards to impacts, education, and otherwise that are forthcoming. So I'm not sure how we 
without all the information, how you get there. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if uh, there is consensus from committee today as it relates to each of the referred items with the exception of referred item number 11. Number 11 is the item that staff will be reporting back on Friday with additional some revised costing. So in order to expedite the process, uh, if council is willing to make a decision on each of the referred items with the exception of 11, which will come back on Friday, that will lend itself to that March 9th council approval date. Okay, is that clear? Um, so we're moving to item two. Councilor Farrar. Through you to- Sorry, oh, Steph. Sorry, Steph. Your question, are you okay to approve it as a now is what I'm asking. As a man. I thought it was just one. I, I, so, I, pass it, yeah. but if we're going to start passing everything, nope. today, right. no, so I'm just asking for five, yeah. so it's up to community. So, I just need to know. So Stephanie's um, provided that um, option for us, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm I'm with you if you want to go through these and advance them to Friday because we do have the meeting Friday, and in the comprehensive context of whatever the provincial budget announcement may be, impacting education, and in light of the AOTA with the darts i'm okay if you want to advance them for another stage i'm okay but if the majority of my colleagues would like to start approving today i'm open-minded too thank okay. you that, so that's what i was suggesting is uh we can amend these and forward them to friday and then friday that's when the rubber hits the road because we'll have all the information then is that okay so we got consensus on that my only concern mr chairman is is that we approve 150 we're probably not going to move off that there's only two opposed and if we don't, Three. if we don't uh, take it till Friday, if we, if we take it Friday, then all this staff has to come back again. And and we're, I'm okay with doing final approval on the 150. Back to work. Okay, let's put this motion on because I'm I'm ready to do this one. Um, so take the chair back. Let's 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 fair. I mean, I'm glad that councillors wanted to leave without having all the uh, data in front of us okay, in regards to where we're because we don't know what the OAD we don't know what the education tax is and we don't know the budget so help me understand I'm going to pass each and every item today it's done no revisiting in absence of not have all the information before us I think that's a sad way of doing business. I don't think you do that business in the business uh, sector. If you want to do that, that's fine. I can't support that. Chair back. Those are my comments. Morning. Appreciating your argument, Mr. Chair. Executive debate on each item um, because this is the second go round, and we're dealing with. So, so, do they all come back? I mean, what's 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 the cost on that? What's the implications internally on bringing all these people who've been sitting here until 2.30 and potentially 5.30 today for the same debate Friday? I mean, this is literally, we did the same thing last year. I'm on for uh, dealing with them, even if, uh, if, if, if you can provide some assurances that we refer to Friday but don't debate all over again on Friday. I mean, to me, uh, three consecutive debates on the same issues. The, today, my understanding was today, we were pricey. We, we had pricey down. These ones, I think we used the term, cut the mustard or passed the test and made it to February 23rd. And February 23rd, my understanding was, when we last debated these items, was the day we made the decisions, and that's why all the staff are present. So I'm a little bit confused. If there's some kind of understanding and appreciating your argument, if there's some kind of assurance you can make, again, I already see some press are leaving, un thinking probably that Friday's the day now that they could they write their stories on, on on individual items because we're not going to accomplish anything here today. As I was under the under under the under the understanding, we were going to make accomplishments today. Thank you. Well, and there'll be a number of you that are prepared to do that. I respect that. Uh, is there any other speakers? Your second time, uh, Mr. Mayor. So, so let's test the will of council because I, I, I'm on for doing this today. This is now the second time around for these uh, list of items, and Friday will be the third time. And I, you know what? Staff time matters to me. We've been here, uh, you know, going through this. We have enough information on all of these, except the AODA one, uh, which is coming back to us on Friday. And so, 
don't don't add me. I'm I'm going I'm going to recommend that we do this today. Uh, so let's test the will of council. Let's see what we want to do, and let's get all in. Okay. So uh, any other speakers on this? So uh, moved by Jason Farr, who likes to make decisions before they're here, and uh, second councillor. Well, oh, sorry, to, to, to alleviate staff time, sorry. And Councillor Ferguson? Councillor Ferguson? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, moved by the Mayor, second by Councillor Farr, that we make the decisions today uh, without the balance of the information coming forward on Friday. All those in favour? Opposed? You want me to move final approval of the 150 now for tourism, Stephanie? Uh, I'll go back to Councillor Jackson. <laughs> oh. You did it last time. Councillor Jackson. Trying to slice into the Ward 6 territory here, Councillor Ferguson. Okay, I would like to once again then for formal approval move that $150,000 with Councillor Collins' amendment that the balance be forwarded to the 2017. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Ferguson for approval today, Mr. Deputy Mayor, pending ratification, of course, of the global budget. All those in favour? Opposed? I want to record as such as well. Okay, number two. Councillor Farr. If Mr. Chairman, our General Manager of uh, Economic Development and Planning, could uh, remind us for a second and final time as we, we debate this item, um, this is of uh, annualized F62,000 net point. Through the chair, so this is an existing end of 2014 um, uh, with the expectation that we would report back as to whether or not it resulted in improvements for business licenses. Uh, so this is, uh, this represents our third, uh, uh, it is a third licensing facilitator. As the uh, information update that was circulated prior to the which, uh, it, which exists today into a permanent Okay, so 67 days to 26 days from the license us. Uh, uh, major accomplishment, uh, proven success. One that I would support here today. Thank you. Yeah, through you too, I guess, Ken. Talk about that uh, there's a negative budget of 325,000 new activities and lotteries. Unachievable in cost recovery for most businesses. That was a number that uh, was uh, put into the budget probably about 10 years ago, uh, $180,000. haven't achieved that uh, in the last 10 years. It's always been $1,000. So, uh, if you sell on the the actual workload, it, it continues to be a significant workload for the facilitators. In relation to us, we've had a reduction in in the break open ticket. Uh, work. I only have three staff. That this it's provincially mandated, and the work to check over the and the, the process is still 150 different charities. They uh, the lottery process put about 10 million dollars back into the community uh, through the charities. So uh, we're currently assessing. I don't see a recommendation. I guess your recommendation goes on the levy. Is that where you're going? You, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's correct. I've had this position since 2000. Uh, it was put in to the 
service to be more open for business. You can see the actual workload of that is is what these facility uh, positions, including zoning. is accepted to the levy and you add ten dollars per license or add a little percentage to coming in at half but business licenses seven we want a five-year phase in and so we are now into the third year of the five-year phase in and that's created a variance of a hundred and seventy thousand so would like we could go right to we're at step two um, as, as Ken said to step three early this year which bought us 70,000 uh, when you get to item that um, we will through phases four and five so we, we've removed that as a Four in uh, enhancement four, which is why we reduced that down to seven hundred sixty thousand from the the, the one point four million. That's part of the uh, the difference that's made up there. If you, we're jumping ahead here a bit. Yes, yeah, through the chair. Sorry, I, I realize I'm jumping ahead, but 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 the question sort of relates also to this one. So if if we if we do something to address that hundred seventy thousand dollar shortfall related to enhancement two, we we couldn't double count it and count the benefit here in in, in oh, gotcha. uh, number four. And your facilitator. So through the chair, it has been funded off the it was initially funded off the ECDEV reserve. Um, council then directed that it be funded through to the remainder of the year. Um, we were just absorbing that cost. Um, so right now it's just being covered through um, uh, absorbing our in our operating. It, initially, it was funded for the initial uh, one-year period off the ECDEV reserve. Because I remember last year, projected you have a hundred seventy thousand dollars surplus, and you, Mayor, if you recall, about uh, four years ago, there was a report that came to council through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, there is uh, there is no positions that are vacant in licensing at this time. Okay, that's all my questions for the time. I'm looking for a get a Joe free card. I Thank you. One. Well, Councillor uh, Pearson, can you take the chair? Can I? Can I? My, my problem with the uh, sixty thousand or sixty-two thousand. First of all, in open for business, we talked about the advantage of using better technologies and better templates and so forth. That you wouldn't need as many facilitators because it would be pretty clear what needed to be done. Second, and, 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 and I'm not sure how much progress we made on that front. So maybe that's my first question. So through the chair, I'll ask Ken to speak to some some of the specifics. But but certainly the the reduction in time to to approve a business license from uh, from 67 days to 26 days. Um, there are other improvements that were made in the process as well. It wasn't entirely resourcing. Um, we would suggest as staff that that was a very significant contributor. Um, but it's not the only thing we're doing. Um, Ken can speak to some of the other uh, um, uh, actions that have been taken within business license to try to improve some of those timelines. And and to you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Or, or the the process what we're looking at um we're several years behind we're just even in animal licensing we're still trying to get that online hopefully when that gets online we can use a similar process to do sign permits online and then eventually liquor permits online but some of these new license applications for business licensing they they require a great deal of of facilitating, dealing with all the stakeholders within the city, uh, guiding the new business owners to, to getting the uh, to the license, and and also the the physical work on on zoning verification. So, uh, the work that these three facilitators do, does uh, really does help new businesses get licensed in in the city of Hamilton. And so, um, unfortunately, if, with the reduction, then that timeline is is going to uh, to uh, uh, get larger and uh, and you're not going to have the same open for business approach as you have now so um, help me understand this because I uh, the question I asked was what have we done on the in technology and uh, a, minute, a non resource side to uh, streamline the product like sorting verification you don't need a, 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 a facilitator to do that that stuff you can do automatically through pro uh, appropriate technology, application appropriate uh, technology. So I'm trying to understand, 
are we babysitting th th this through? Are we providing a template that really clearly tells them who they talk to, where they go, where their information is available, step one through you know, A to Z, or are we babysitting them all the way through? We are uh, working in processes. Uh, Amanda was one of the issues that uh, over the last uh, year or so has made significant improvements. Uh, it's not there yet for us to, to go automated in, in sign or liquor permits or in, in the zoning thing. I think we're several years out. So we are holding businesses' hands to help them get licensed in the city of Hamilton, and that is bringing in significant okay. revenue for the city. So the technology is not there yet. That's what I was looking for. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. The other uh, build, so when I look at the, you're looking at getting to zero. The problem is if we prove this, you're now building into the base. $62,000 that's going to be annualized forever. So help me understand if you already know you're going to go to zero, you got a plan between your four and stage five, then why would we build this onto the levy? So th through, the, through the chair, what we're looking at in terms of getting to zero in terms of the, uh, the revenues, um, that gets us the presents is, is in the issue business licenses as we did in the past, um, it will just take longer. So what we're looking at here is this is enhanced level of service beyond the level of service that those fees were aligned to uh, back when that fee, re fee review was done a couple of years ago. But I, th I think what I'm hearing, uh, maybe I, I misunderstood, but I, I, I thought in, and you showed uh, item four, you talked about uh, there's uh, this phasing going on, stage four, stage five. So I thought that uh, it was to sustainability where that 760 variance was gone um, and, and this additional staff wouldn't be needed because it would be paying for itself through this process. So if you already have a plan that will establish this position to be paid for once you get through that implementation stage, then why would we not, why would we put this on the levy knowing that it won't be needed in two years? So through the chair, so the, the, the fee rates that that, um, uh, that fee review was based on, um, that was phased in over, over five phases, um, was based on the level of service that anticipated two licensing facilitators, and I believe it's two clerks as well, um, as, the, as the staff complement. What we did in 2015 um, with funding from the ECDEV Reserve was to give an enhanced level of service up to three licensed uh, license facilitators, and that's what created the, uh, the improvement in terms of processing times. Um, if we only, um, if we stick with the two license facilitators, which is what the fees are currently based on, um, then we would bring back to a previous and we're back towards the 60 day range. So, and I'm not just two versus three. I think the thing is if you have a program that's going to see it sustainable and self funded, I think so, uh, I, in fact, I don't I don't think my taxpayers should be subsidizing uh, people getting licensing fees. Uh, I think that should be a cost recovery. We've all agreed that we need to do cost recovery. So understanding that and understanding you have a plan, then I guess my question, well, why would you build it to the levy if you've got a plan in two years that you'll be cost recover from the licenses that will cover those costs for those three? So through the chair, I think um, uh, Ken's report is 6.2 on the agenda. Uh, cost, but you won't, you, you're already building in this into the levy, so you're not cover it you know, and how you reconcile those two pieces is when we would look at what are the uh, what are the co full cost recovery fees for for uh, fee review which is part of the, uh, the the business licensing review so if in fact you end up there Through the chair, I would suggest that it that, that would be. Take the chair back. You got any speakers? I have Councillor Jackson. Report this, Jason. Uh, you and I have chatted in the last little while about this is enhancing the collaboration between licensing, building, not being a silo, a ping pong between departments. So. I think, Jason, you understand the gist of uh, my comment. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to And say it, it takes some hand-holding. Thank you, Jason. As long as staff are collaboratively committed mm -hmm. to that, I'm satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. Any further, Councillor Johnson? Thank you. Um, through you to Jason, how much does it cost to get a zoning verification? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, it's about $250. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I thought it was a lot higher than that. So, Ken, I'm really having a bit of a um, struggle right now uh, because my understanding is that this position is eventually going to be cost recovery. Is that what I heard? That we eventually can become recovery. I understand that the uh, the like why we dealt with significant periods of five hundred thousand. Then down to 320, down to two, as it will also have a cost per license. That will take into consideration the, the licensing department for the, the cost of each license. Thank you for that. But, um, through, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. The the position was put in in 2014 and reserves uh, when the uh, funding expired. We open for business committee to to justify the right. position. The okay. open for business said, position. It works well. Continue to fund it, and so now we're just coming forward as for at least 24 months with that it's, you're saying it's still not cost recovery cost recovery of licensing wanted to phase it over five uh, five years a variance of Licensing. Once, in fact, we get past that, Thank you. so my understanding is that eventually, of the fees based on the when we come forward with um, um, levy subsidy in business licensing, the license fees that would apply um, what that fee will be I didn't tell you the number now what that fee would be for you for you to consider it'd be, it'd be fully based on fees and Ken's report in 6.2 is cost recovery now um, what that fee increase looks like is, is what we were asked to, to do at the last thank you uh, I have no further speakers on this do I uh, so I'm entertaining a moment um, call and second in favor item three 350 so through you mr. deputy mayor item 3 was deferred you'll recall I mentioned that the last GIC item 3 was covered off in the 2016 capital budget and therefore it's captured here as a uh, deferred item. so we need to move to receive it moved by councillor Collins second by count uh, council Pearson all those in favor all, all those opposed carried item 4 Councilor Pearson Sorry, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I want to be sure, Mike, do we not need to formalize that as far as item three, that it's coming out of the 2016 capital? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, was approved as part of the capital budget. Uh, if committee wishes, we could uh, just approve the deferral of this item outside of the budget process, right, in terms of the amending schedule. Yes. Why so, would we defer it? Yes. Because yeah, then that sorry, means it's okay. still active. So yeah. Yeah. I think it was received in the last one, so we know yeah, we right. don't have to deal with three at all. Item four. Be clear on item four, Mr. Chair, if I could.
for five years? No, no, just for the one year. In one just year, and Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Councillor, I believe the minutes have shown from the IC budget meeting one year is being brought back and considered the following four years. Thank you. Okay, so everything uh, straight, no other speakers. Duly moved and second. All those in favor? Carried. Carried. So that's done. Denise, you. Uh, item six. I have. Uh, Pearson. I've had a huge community that's up in arms. So here's the two is about $3,600. Per uh, subsidized individual, if I remember that right, I had a number of people that pay that in taxes, and they're struggling. And so their point, question to me is, hang on, my full taxes are going to hypothetically to providing this service. They're going to get a subsidy on a monthly basis, and I'm barely struggling just to pay the taxes and stay in my home. So that was the feedback I got uh, uh, at that meeting, and the other issue and concern I have, by the way, I, those are concerns raised by the community, it's not necessarily my position. But my position is, uh, uh, is concerning in regards to we're increasing, we continue to increase uh, the subsidies at $3,700 and $666 is what a concern is. Uh, when I look at medium, high, and low uh, risk individuals, we're, we're trying to close the gap, which I think is uh, uh, laudable in regards to the uh, the waiting list. I think it's 7,000 we're trying to, uh, we, we got a process to try and get to 50% of that. So the question, the first question is, when we talk about, uh, is that just the housing list or is it anyone waiting for housing? Did I get clarity on that? Through the Deputy Mayor, it would be 50% of those households that are on the social housing wait list. On the social house, so everybody that uh, are, that um, need supportive housing, um, or have mental health challenges, um, are at high risk. Do they all fall in on the list of the housing uh, waiting list, or would they fall in other areas as well? Um, I would say that. Okay, here's the chart. On, um, in fact, we had three residential care facilities, I believe. Rightly, um, because there were poor operators in Ward 3, um, lost their subsidy. Now, my understanding is many of those people stayed uh, as long as they practically could in those homes with no subsidy. My understanding is that those homes are now having um, a, a challenge paying the bills and whatever the issue is. So obviously these people need to be moved. They own them at the... Uh, market value, even, so help me understand, they're taking in for market value even though they qualify for subsidy. Can you clarify how that works? Through the chair, um, I think it would probably be better if I explain to you the situation with the wait list for the domiciliary hostel subsidy program. So what we basically have is a situation where we do have a budget of $6.7 million a year for individuals to receive a subsidy to stay in a residential care facility, and that is called the Domiciliary Hostel Program. So um, last year, the um, operators got an increase um, to $50 a day per diem and also the residents that live there also got an increase from 138 to $150 for their own personal needs. And at the time that that decision was made and approved by council, we did indicate that there was a possibility because of these increases that we would have to implement a wait list. So uh, a wait list is not something that we take lightly and that we want to do. But in this case, starting January 1st, we implemented a wait list for this subsidy um, to stay within the budget, which is $6.7 million a year. And so um, what we needed to do basically is decrease the number of people who receive a subsidy to 740 residents from approximately 765. So for the months of January 
January and February, we did not grant any new subsidies. But beginning in March, it will be on a one-in, one-off basis. So what we basically have at this point in time is 27 people who are on the wait list, the active wait list. So in other words, they are waiting for a subsidy. Some of these people are waiting for discharge from hospital, some are living with their families, and then some are in residential care facilities but paying market cost. So that is the situation with the domiciliary hostel wait list at this point in time. So uh, I guess my, my, my point is that these are probably the highest risk individuals. We have actually gone backwards in regards to how many clients we're actually serving. In fact, we're creating a waiting list now, uh, which we didn't have before. And yet, on the other side, we're making uh, $1.1 million, and I think that's annualized, if I remember right. Is that correct? This, this program on the housing side is annualized at $1.1 million a year? Through the chair, uh, that is correct. So that's an additional million a year, every year, uh, on the housing subsidy side, trying to close that waiting list, and yet we created a waiting list with the highest risk. So I guess what I'm looking at is housing is housing uh, to me in respect to ensuring that we deal with the most vulnerable in our community. Creating a waiting list with that group is, is, is untollable. I'm looking at 825,000 here. So my question to staff then is if we're trying to bring us to the same client level versus subsidy, in the RCS, what would we need? So the pre-waiting list period. To the chair, at this point in time, in order to um, not have a waiting list for the domiciliary hostel subsidy, it would cost approximately $320,000 on an annual basis, remaining at a premium of $50. Okay, and the, the what is it, 8000 what are we paying? Uh, we increase the uh, rates that we increase the um, the spend. The um, per uh, province dictated a minimum of one hundred and thirty-eight dollars a month, and we increased it to one hundred and fifty dollars a month, given the requests from the residents and also we did a program review of the domiciliary hostel program and that was one of the recommendations as yeah. well to start so, to increase that amount. So it's not a criticism by any stretch, but it, 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 it's a point that there was a need on both fronts that were identified, underfunded and the individuals didn't uh, uh, feel they had enough disposable income in those homes. So prudent decisions were made. The problem is now is that you're, you're, you're trying to close a gap on the lower risk uh, individuals into the health and housing, and yet on the high risk, we've created a waiting list. And uh, I'm told that, okay, 320,000, we can get rid of that waiting list. So what, I'm, uh, what would be the impact if we took half of that? So 150,000 from this fund to offset the highest risk people into our RCS. Through the chair, if I could just comment as far as your comment on it being the highest risk, we actually um, have a housing allowance program um, that is already in place with federal provincial funding where um, council had approved uh, directing the housing allowance to housing first clients. So housing first clients are, I would say, the highest risk or certainly in that category and that they are chronic shelter use in a situation have been homeless more than once. With the housing allowances exceeded our target as that they have the case support so that they say that we are offered choice than we haven't ever, ever before at one potential care facilities, which is more of a group home setting, was really one of the few options that people have. But now we have been able to expand that option to not only residential care facilities, which is very appropriate and the choice of some, but also that some people are also 
able to live independently in their own small apartment with um, case supports. Okay, I'm, I'm a bit confused because my understanding, and I've been in, and I've been touring these homes, and and I'm really, really, really confused. One of the biggest challenges we have is support for housing, and we want to put the highest risk individuals where there's support, supportive housing. There's very limited funds for for supportive housing. This program here, for example, isn't about supportive housing. It's about a subsidy to put people into housing units. It's not supportive housing, is that correct? To the chair, uh, this additional housing allowance program that we have would house 287 people and provide them with a housing allowance or a housing subsidy. At this point in time, we expect that these would be people come off the social housing wait list. The, of up to six or more, and as far as their personal needs go, I think that it would be an individualized situation. Yeah, but, uh, so this is not supportive housing, though? Funding. Through the chair, that is correct. Okay, so I want to focus on housing, which I'm a higher risk client. We've just increased uh, a waiting list for that higher client, higher risk client group. All I'm asking, and I mean, I compassion, I'm surprised I'm getting, it fear feels like I'm getting resistance. The, the higher risk people that we've now created a waiting list for, who choose to go into our CFs, I'm asking that we bring this funding down by 150,000 and offset that waiting list with those dollars. What is the implication on this program by reducing it by 150,000? Through the chair, um, it would certainly be council's decision if they would choose to reduce the amount of housing allowances and direct it to the domiciliary hostel program instead. So I would say that if it is reduced by 150,000, there would be fewer individuals, and I'm sorry I don't have my calculator with me, um, who would be able to access the housing allowance program. Okay, so... Um I don't know what that number is, so at the appropriate time, hopefully we'll have that number. I would ask uh, on this one, since I want to work with staff and hopefully find a compromise, if we can park this one till Friday so that we can sort of iron out with that detail what those numbers and implications are, and then uh, uh, I don't need to debate it again. It's whether, this, whether the committee would support, would support uh, uh, offsetting that waiting list for the, uh, the higher risk people that are now uh, waiting uh, for the subsidies in their homes. So those are my comments. I'll take the chair back. I have Councillor Collins and Councillor Ferguson. Uh, through you to Jillian. Jillian, can I ask why you wouldn't have made that recommendation then in terms of what Councillor Whitehead's proposing? Why, why wasn't that in front of us in, as a, uh, an enhancement? Uh, through the chair, uh, further to conversations we had when we discussed this prior to um, increasing, uh, that wasn't in the house, that's not in the Housing and Homelessness Action Plan, which is approved by council. We're trying to stick to that plan, which is uh, in getting people into permanent stable housing is the priority. That's the housing first plan. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, the high needs, as Jillian has said, some of these people that are using housing alliances, allowances are high need. Um, the people in residential care facilities, they have different needs. Um, some of them are higher needs than others. The women that we can't access in the shelters right now, in the women's shelter, are high needs. We've got all these holes all over the community in terms of housing issues that we're trying to um, fill. And we're at the same time trying to stick to the priorities that have been approved by the province and federal government and this council and from a housing first perspective. Right, so you're, you're addressing the greatest need in your mind as it relates to the plan that we've approved. Information that we have on hand in terms of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was we were aiming at reducing the housing wait list, cutting it in half by 2023, which unfortunately we're nowhere close to accomplishing. This would in part try to address the, the direction that Council had provided as it relates to reducing that wait list and addressing the fact that there are people with high needs 
that will be serviced by this budget enhancement of 800 plus thousand. Is that correct? Um, through you, that's uh, correct. And not to for the other report that we brought to committee on the wait list issue, further to Councillor's uh, question around supports, was bringing the access to housing wait list in house and adding a case management support so that we would be providing some sort of support to people on the wait list as it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of where people, yes, the housing allowance isn't the support people need, but it's what they need to get into permanent stable housing, which is the housing first principle. And from that point, we provide the service that they need, the supports that they need once they're permanently housed. Thanks for that. And I just want to confirm that this is in fact, um, staff are accomplishing in a very small years ago as it relates to uh, dealing with our, our um, homelessness and housing plan. And I, um, I, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago at committee, uh, providing housing allowances is the cheapest alternative in trying to find someone um, safe and affordable housing. It, uh, as you know, when we look at building new units, the average cost of a new unit in an apartment is $200,000 to build a new one. And there are very few developments going on in this city right now other than a couple in Councillor Marula's ward that where we find new units that are trying to get at the wait list. The cheapest alternative in terms of trying to find an individual who's on that wait list or a family is to give housing allowances, which allows them to go into the marketplace locally and find accommodation within the existing rental housing stock that we have in the city. So why we would pit the Dom Haas pro program against our housing program, I, I don't understand from a political perspective, number one and why we would eat into the housing allowance, which is getting at the people with the highest needs for housing and the shelter, is, uh, I don't understand that either. So the highest needs. Pardon me? Sorry, okay. go ahead. We just heard from our staff. I, you, okay, well, you, you may not like the answer, but that's the answer that's been provided by people who manage the programs, including the one that you've referenced, Mr. Chairman. So, you, so from that perspective, I would suggest that council stick to our guns in terms of addressing the plan this is a very small enhancement in the context of what the need is right now. And if we were to price out what the need was to, to accommodate everyone on the wait list, the 56 or 5,700, and that number's constantly moving, if we were to ask in terms of using the housing allowance program or build new units alternative, we're talking tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars, which we cannot afford to do as we've all mentioned in the past. It's not something that municipalities can afford to do on their own. And we know that something is coming from the province and federal government um, soon. We don't know what that is yet, but this in a very small way shows that the city is committed to the plan that we adopted many years ago. And it's a sound investment and it's a calculated investment and it's one that our staff support. And I'm not interested in shifting gears today in terms of making a knee jerk reaction to something that may have some legitimacy but to pit one against the other, I don't think makes any sense at all, financially or politically, to be honest with you. So, uh, Council Person? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to Jill. Sorry. No, no, I thought you wanted to speak to it. Sorry, Council Ferguson. Thank you. Thank so you to Jill or Joanne. Is part of this exasperated or part of this need result? Up the cost of real estate, which is taking up. Um, certainly uh, the social housing wait list. Uh, the increase in the social housing wait list is because the um, cost of um, renting in Hamilton has increased basically by 20% since 2006 and certainly markedly since 2011. And also our vacancy rates have gone down as well and that's all part and parcel of the changes in the real estate market here in Hamilton. So the answer to my question is yes. And I'm going to support this, Mr. Chair. However, you know, we've heard a lot about housing and, and shortage of it uh, and the wait list. Uh, I want to summarize again, and, and Mr. Garrick put it up on the screen, to attack this, the public needs to know, and I hope the media picks up on this, is that we've got an additional capital this year for, for housing. we got an additional $2.4 million in Joanne's operating budget, which goes on forever, and now annualized another $1.1 million here which is a total of $7.3 million. So we haven't been sitting on our hands in this thing. Uh, that's a big investment in one year for one program, and uh, but it's it's needed, so. Thank you. So all those in, uh, sorry, I need a mo uh, mover. 
moved by Councillor moved by Councillor Collins, second by Councillor Brula. All those in favor? Hearing. Opposed? Next item, uh, McCaster Lodge, Councilor Jackson. offices or through uh, direct input from citizens. Um, the reality is that we're receiving over 800 requests in 2015. We expect that to increase in 2016 and therefore we're leaving on the table about 500 from last year still at this point in time. And we're 150 each if we get one. We will not meet the mandate. Uh, if it continues, your request behind, so that's a, what a year or two, year lag catch up, Deputy Mayor. And if we gave you one in half, if we gave you the two, uh, through the chair, uh, it's not a matter of catching up at this point, it's a matter of staying, uh, uh, keeping our heads above water. And uh, if we don't get the two, we certainly will fall behind further and further uh, by the end of this year. Um, so I would say that two will keep us basically answering requests and one will not. Okay, so uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor Martin, I've always found Manager White to be a very, very reasonable man. And I was just looking to see if he could say that yes, he could live with one this year. Give him a loan is quite uh, exorbitant in terms of all the traffic requests for traffic calming, etc., that my community uh, gives through my office onto traffic. So, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm, I'm prepared to support the two pending uh, comments from my colleagues. Thank you. So, uh, on item 12, yeah, I'm on the list. Great, Council Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm very pleased to uh, to support this. Um, certainly, the amount of time that uh, the traffic engineers have been spending in my ward with all the new development they're they're now coming on stream. We're assuming many of these developments, and I had a public meeting last night. Joanne was there, and uh, she's she's been involved with three or four of the working uh, resident working groups that I've had for traffic calming throughout uh, Waterdown, the eighth concession. And uh, I, I just, I'm amazed at, at how much work that, um, that your 
your staff takes on. So I'm very pleased to uh, to support this. I think that's where we need to uh, to beef up the, the staffing for sure to be able to carry out what our residents are expecting from us. So I'm prepared to move it, second it, whatever. Thank you. Okay, so uh, any other speakers? All those in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Carried. So we're now to 13. No, that's 14. That's proposed deferred. 15. The Richmond Fund, moved by uh, Mayor, second by Councillor Jackson. Any further discussion on 50? That's an enhancement, Rich, Richmond Fund? Yes. Seeing none, all those in favor? Carry. Any opposed? Carry. Waterfront Trust. I move that, Mr. Deputy. Councillor Parson. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Carry. Any opposed? Carry. Thank you. Number 17. Move Residential drainage, moved by. What did I hear that? Councilor Pearson, second by Councilor Partridge. All those in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Next Carried. I'll move to 19. Uh, 19. Oh, sorry, 18? Yeah, 18. Three colors. <laughs> 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 move by Councilor Marilla, sorry. Second by uh, the Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. Councilor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just again to re refresh our memories one more time. Those dollars were previously approved and absorbed between the two departments of Public Works and MLE. That's all that's here before us is the FTE approval. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Uh, 19. That's a public health nurse, a comment? Oh, that's me. Yeah. Moved by Councilor Marula. Yeah. Second by Councilor the Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Carried. 22. Discovered Vista, Councilor Jackson, moved second by the Mayor, all those in favor. Any opposed? We're going to talk about the Vista program. 22. 22. 22. and alternatives available to us and I I just want to confirm that the original request for this information was asking whether or not our off-street parking lots could get um, or are we at parity with private sector lots and what would it take to get to parity with private sector lots if in fact we are below the average and I just want to confirm that the ten dollars would uh, on the off-street lots the ten dollar option would get us to parity to or in the ballpark with private sector operators who operate or own lots in the downtown or elsewhere in the city just to be clear so through mr. deputy mayor if you look at the report it says that our lots are between two dollars and fifty cents to eighty dollars difference from the private sector but ten dollars would put us uh, close to virtually all of them okay so I believe that based on the public consultation the feedback that uh, going with the increase for off-street lots the ten dollar option I'd certainly move that I want to confirm though what the um, what the net result would be as it relates to new revenue sources for us before we move on deputy mayor for ten dollars across the board for all, all of our municipal car parks it'd be about two hundred fifty thousand dollars in that uh, new revenues uh, the net would be uh, there'd be about sixty one thousand dollars in downtown parkers that are city employer paid parking so okay. 250,000 minus 61,000 all right so I would move the uh, $10 option at the appropriate time on the on-street um, revenues it 
I know that we've received uh, sufficient feedback from many of the BIAs. I want to be clear that we certainly don't have consensus on this at this point in time, and I want to ask through you to Marty, traditionally, have we allowed certain BIAs to make increases while leaving others at a lower rate, or have we traditionally adopted a one pricing structure fits all scenario in the past through you? Sure, Mr. Deputy Mayor, normally we have the uh, same parking rates on all streets in the city. Only uh, about 30 years ago, we used to have a higher rate in the downtown area only, and many cities still do that, where they have a higher rate in the downtown, but not individual BIAs having different rates. Okay. So I'm certainly, I don't have a BIA, but I've read the letters and the comments, and um, I'll leave it to my colleagues to do that regard. But I, I would defer, in fact, we don't have consensus, is defer it to um, the BIA, the Habia Committee, for our staff to meet with them and, and, and go through and address the issue through the 216 calendar year and come back with something for the 217 budget if we can find consensus. And so uh, I understand we did a study on this a number of years we ago, did. and that um, should be part of the discussion as well. So anyway, those are my comments. If you can come back to me for those two motions at the appropriate time. So I have Councillor Marilla, Councillor Farr, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Adam. Well, at the appropriate time, I want to second the motion to defer item to uh, Abia. Uh, secondly, I think um, this is an, an issue that should have been done not that it's being uh, pursued. Okay. Having said that, I, I think uh, only Councillor Farr. Councillor Farr. Thank you, and um, sir, I, I all I'd like to support or second the uh, ten percent increase on off street, and then the deferral. Councillor Marul, I believe, asked to second the uh, investigation, further investigation on on street or meter parking. So that's, and I'm supportive of both, obviously. Uh, and I want to thank, first and foremost, the BIAs, all as a, a collaboration, uh, had a discussion, I guess, meeting. Since we've had two correspond here today, both are downtown BIAs, uh, International Village and uh, the downtown BIA. As a councillor and discussions in the past as well, clearly with their Village BIA and the downtown BIA uh, prepared to accept these street or uh, uh, but uh, both uh, passed and uh, smiling because Kathy Drew it's here from the downtown BIA uh, we had two consecutive meetings Ted Arnold from our uh, parking office joined us at the second meeting and we've had some healthy debates at the BIA, uh, BIA table on parking increases, and, and there's some references to uh, past motions and reports from long before my time. Uh, but there's also clearly in this report, and it's a brief report, but it's a good one to give us a sense of where wise. Uh, you're really getting uh, more bang for your buck parking in downtown Hamilton than anywhere else in Ontario, essentially. Uh, the meters are a buck an hour, and uh, nowhere else in Ontario are they that cheap. We may be tied with North Bay, I could be wrong. but um, so, so it's something we need to look at, and that's what we're doing with this uh, deferral, and also at the same time appreciating, uh, Mr. Chairman, where our, uh, our BIAs are at with the on-street meters. Now, one of the things we've talked about, and they're referenced um, by the International Village, as a matter of fact, here today in their correspondence, is technology. So if I may ask through you to Marty or Ted, who's here, and we appreciate uh, Ted being here, or Jason, um, and others have tweeted and, and uh, corresponded on, on what technologies can add to a parking system. And certainly we've debated in the past, in fact, the first debate I recall from Planning Committee was from Councillor Ferguson, who asked for a credit card machine six years ago at City Hall. We got them last year, I think. Can we or have we anything with respect to an update on, uh, on our parking systems, how new technologies such as but not limited to credit cards or apps uh, to make uh, uh, payment methods uh, um, through, through apps or credit cards, have we anything that we can update here today that may both assist uh, the customer quite obviously but also our parking operations through you to the appropriate staff, Madam Chair. So through Madam Chair, I think uh, definitely we need to get into better technology and different types of payment options. 
We're not there yet. We have some uh, issues with sustainability of our reserve, but that's something we do need to look at. And so would it be helpful to look at this in the referral and at the same time um, from the aspect of what savings we would create should a 10% a increase on the uh, off street or $10, sorry, I keep saying 10%, thank you for that correction, it's a big difference. So a $10 uh, across the board increase on off street, would that assist, Marty, through you, Chair? Thank you, Madam Chair, we have been increasing our contribution from current to capital by about 50,000 a year. If this uh, revenue generated through this initiative was put to our reserve, certainly would be helpful, but we do have to do a full analysis of the funding for our reserve. And, and is it important that we analyze once again the costs of these technologies? I mean, if I've heard the argument in the past, I don't know whether we've debated it at a committee level, but you know, Visa machine parking uh, technologies cost us X and apps may as well. So is that something we could look at when we refer the meter uh, issue back? If we refer the meter issue back. Madam Chair, yes, I think we should. Our current reserve is uh, maintaining the assets that we have. There's not a lot of provision for new technology, and I think we need to take a, a strategic look on how we can start to implement new technology on the streets. And may we also include uh, what it would look like if those new technologies were also adapted on off-street and in our lots. And Park Aids. Madam Chair, yes. Okay, great. Uh, through you to, uh, just a few more questions here, to Ted or, or Marty. Um, the report references uh, other jurisdictions who base parking rates based on location. Uh, I see Toronto, it goes anywhere from, um, I think it's 2 to $4, and Winnipeg is $1 to $5 on the meters. Have we ever in the past, out of my own curiosity, looked at that, or could we look at that if we refer um, uh, a range of rates? I was under the impression early on, uh, as downtown councillor, that everything had to be status quo and the same across the entire city. I understand and that's not necessarily true through you chair you, madam chair we could look at a range of rates but the most popular across ontario is, is a, a rate across the city and a higher rate in a downtown of a municipality okay so you could look at that through you chair yes we could okay and finally when did we last look at what we charge private lot owners for public enforcement i'm sure we don't, we don't charge for that service we keep the revenue from any tickets issued on private property all oh, right right and in, in in private in publicly enforcing private lots the customers who get dinged aren't getting dinged for trespassing they're only getting a, a much a smaller amount ticketed can you explain how that works through you chair Madam Chair, uh, for many years we've enforced private property where we simply have authority from a private property owner to enter onto the property and issue a parking ticket. And those parking tickets, uh, council sets the amounts and normally it's based on uh, uh, an adequate deterrent for people to, dis to obey the law as well as uh, comparison with uh, fines in other municipalities. Uh, we do know that some private operators hire their own companies uh, to do enforcement and uh, we have no control over what they charge and how they collect those, those charges. Yeah, and, and uh, generally can only, if we enforce, we can go by municipal bylaws. If they were to enforce privately, it becomes a trespassing fine and it's a much greater amount. Is that not true through you, Chair? Correct. Okay, I wonder if there's a way we could also, with the referral, come back to us at an appropriate time and look at maybe a fee for that service to, again, help us with our, our parking costs. Is that is that something we could look at? Madam Chair, for many years we've simply done it on the basis of uh, keeping the revenue, um, but certainly we could look at some type of administrative fee that goes into enforcing those lots. I'd like to, maybe, I'll, I'll, I'm hitting Marty totally out of left field on this one, so maybe offline we could have the discussion just on that item, uh, and we'll leave that for uh, away from this referral item. Uh, finally, I would suggest that... Um, uh, actually, I think I, I covered most of the, the, the technology stuff really interests me. Um, this communities that are doing it, and there's a lot of people that feel, you know, we're, we're arguing, and I'll just have to make some quick comments. We're arguing that, uh, and we have historically, um, that we're hearing from people outside of the downtown that they won't come downtown because they have to pay for parking. 
The reality is, most if not all the downtowns who pay for parking, you know, throughout Canada, throughout North America, probably throughout the world, it's just uh, the reality of, of downtowns. In, 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 here in Hamilton, you get a really good deal, probably the best in Ontario, maybe the best in Canada. We didn't look at across Canada. But there are efficiencies and technology or other aspects to make a visit downtown more appealing. First of all, uh, privately, for the most part, burgeoning uh, um, a scene that's been created by small business and, and, and is seen clearly uh, well beyond our, our city borders as an attraction. And a dollar an hour at a meter isn't preventing people from those meters. We have on April 15th in planning committee coming at us and we're tackling how to parkades as opposed to our increasing vitality. It's a detriment. Uh, but but technologies are, are assisting other communities as well. And I think the reason why we've prevented moving forward in, in very minor ways we have moved forward these uh, moving forward with apps and, and, and swipes, whether they're Interact or Visas, is because it costs us to operate those technologies. And if we start utilizing revenues from parking to look at ways in which we can offset those costs and, and create uh, opportunities for those, and you hear it all the time, who don't carry change in their pocket anymore, uh, who don't have quarters, uh, let alone nickels and dimes, then I think we're, we're we're creating a good customer service environment here in the core and elsewhere in the city. So I really want to uh, uh, take some time and focus on that offline with, with staff. And I think our BIAs would, oh, clearly they've articulated that they're interested in pursuing answers to that end as well. So I, I'm committed to do that. But for what's before us here, thanks again to International Village BIA, Downtown Hamilton BIA, the largest BIA in the city, for their input and, and their uh, thumbs up on the off-street parking increase of $10, not 10%. And uh, I know we'll have some hard between now and what comes back to a meter park. Thank you. Jackson? Mr. Deputy Mayor, I would um, just ask that concession be exempted um, from any uh, increase, both a couple of small car parks they have, as well as I'm glad that the meter, the on street meter, uh, deferred for a larger uh, discussion. I was at the BIA concession meeting a week ago today and and groans and they just went through as you all know a very nine month difficult full reconstruction last year. Some businesses did not survive. A lot of them were hanging on. Thank you Councillor Ferguson then Arlene. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah I, uh I've noticed that we have this the one quite a bit of an investment in that area. I understand that there's that, that area. But so um, I'm supportive. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Well, and I'll tell you why. The only place where the place with the uh, land permission done parking lots, they took out a loan and paved those parking lots many years ago. And Dundas does not have any parking lots in competition with the municipal parking lots. Um, not very long ago, the Dundas parking lot rate was, re was increased. And so in Dundas, the people who use the parking lots have only recently received an increase in their parking lot rate. And um, um, I have actually got a note here from the Dundas BIA who are extremely concerned about raising the rates in Dundas. Um, I, I certainly can't argue with uh, the fact that um, raising the rates in the downtown lots 
in the city lots makes um, good. But I think that you have to look at the neighborhood community where some of these lots are have contributed and what they um, where they have had increases in the past that have been over and above what the other lots have experienced. And so to put another increase on top of that uh, is a difficulty. And so the BIA is actually asking me to um, not support that increase in Dundas. So if I could partner on to a motion with Councillor Jackson, um, that would be great. If not, I am asking for that exemption this time and in keeping with the year's deferral about the meter parking, I'm, I'm quite happy to support that. So thank you very much. Answer, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, a couple of questions. So on the, on the $10 increased fee motion, uh, are, is, are there monthly parking lots on Concession Street? No, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe that there are, but I could be to, wrong. To Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think there's one one lot in Concession Street BIA. One, okay. And then uh, on the revenue side, so the 250,000 that we would generate globally save and accept exemptions that we make, uh, would then get put back in the reserves and you'll look, you'll, so it's not, a, it's not a levy reduction, it's a, you're gonna put it to reserves and then use that to enhance parking meter, parking machines, credit card access, I mean, it's not everything, but that's going to be part of how you're going to utilize that money. So it's not a levy reduction. It's going to be a utilization of those funds for improved parking. Deputy Mayor, yes, that would be the goal. Okay. That's great. I support that. I thank you very much. Uh, you know what? Um, one parking lot, I guess, uh, is not a bad exemption to offer, I suppose. But, I, I mean, I worry about, uh, you know, making exceptions all the way through the down the line here. Then it becomes uh, a little complicated. But notwithstanding, we'll see what council wants to do. But I certainly support uh, both the motions that are before us right now. Thank you. Council President, can you take the chair? Can I um, just ask, are we recovering enough uh, dollars from the off-lot uh, parking lots, the, the uh, parking spaces, in regards to uh, maintenance, enforcement, and snow removal? from the parking revenue that we're generating from those parking lots? Uh, through the chair, so Hamilton Municipal Parking System is a self-sustaining business unit. So in terms of enforcement, on-street maintenance and operations and off-street maintenance operations, uh, we do turn money back to the levy each year, as well as we finance all of our own capital contributions and we revenue share with the BIAs. Okay, so help me understand again, if you broke that down further, because that's a collective, that's meters everything off-road parking lots is the rates paying for the uh, and, and parking lots uh, sufficient to pay for the ongoing maintenance in, uh, cost uh, the ongoing snow removal cost so through the chair uh, I can get that information but I don't have that broken out today okay so I, I Look, I, I know this is a sensitive issue, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go uh, and, and listen to uh, my, and I've heard some of the comments from the colleagues. I was hoping that uh, we would get to a level of sustainability in regards to the off-road uh, um, parking lots that, uh, in fact, uh, the revenue being generated uh, was cost recovery, at the very least, for those particular parking lots. And I'm not hearing that at this point in time. Uh, so. I look forward to that breakdown uh, at a later date, certainly for the 2017 budget. So those are my comments, and I'll take the chair back. I have no other speakers. So I'm going to go back because I think there's a couple of motions. Um, where do I go first? Councillor Jackson? Okay. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, moved by myself, Councillor Partridge wanted to second it for all include uh, Dundas and uh, concession uh, at this time that there be no increase, the $10 increase for the car parks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Fark. So, concession, a small lot, given the uh, construction nightmares, I'm supportive. Dundas, I'm reflecting on a recent debate about a development where the executive director of the BIA came in and, and essentially didn't, uh, uh, wasn't, shared with us that to my recollection, 
uh, uh, not being in favor of that development, despite the fact that I was trying to ask the question, wouldn't you as a, uh, a, a, a BIA be supportive of all those extra people living so close to your BIA? Uh, we started talking, too, as well, about parking. And if I can, through you, um, I mean, essentially, and, and I, I can't verbatim make a, a comment on what I heard from the executive director, other than the feeling I was left with from this executive director of the Dundas BIA is business is going very well. And so from a supply and demand argument, clearly if business is going well, these parking lots are being utilized. And so through you to uh, Marty, do you have anything statistically, uh, given that there's a larger number of off-street parking uh, lots in Dundas compared to uh, what we're dealing with with concession, relatively minor, small amendment compared to Dundas. Can you offer anything in terms of utilization rates uh, with Dundas? And uh, given those, the impression that I was left with by the executive director of the BIA on, on business going well there in Dundas and thus the supply and demand argument? Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor, we don't have the utilization today. We can get it. I can tell you, though, that the lots in Dundas are all, all very well used. So if they're well used, and this report even references uh, this supply and demand argument to an extent, um, then, then we can assume. I mean, look at the waiting list downtown. It's over 1,000 people. And across the city, I think it's about 1,200 or close to 1,200. And some are willing to weekly passes. I, I, I'm guessing Dundas is probably in pretty good shape to, to be able to accommodate a, a relatively minor $10 uh, increase. So I, 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 I won't. I won't uh, discourage the um, amendment now, but I wouldn't want to vote on the Dundas piece yet. And again, this was the impression I was left by your executive director in Dundas as it related to a very recent debate we had about a development. And if I have time to now, you know, maybe we can uh, floor this one, wait till, uh, 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 defer it and wait till Friday, is it? Then I have an opportunity to uh, review that debate and, and quote, um, quote from what the executive director said. Uh, this kind of came at me uh, just now. So I, I understand and appreciate where it comes from. Um, certainly, again, to reiterate, I've had many debates with our own BIAs in downtown and appreciate that uh, they see uh, where, we're, uh, where we're going from a, a supply and demand standpoint. On that as well, if I can say quickly, I was a second time speaker. Um, can we also get on April 15th staff to report back, Mr. Chairman, on the transportation demand management argument and uh, conversations that have been taking place to date and partnerships that have occurred. I know there have been some relatively minor with our parking office. So if we're going to get an update on, uh, and that, that was through a council uh, ratified motion, transportation demand management and our part on, on mandates that this council has to try to get people to focus on other means and ways in which to commute and park and do those things. Uh, if we can get an update on April 15th when we have our, our parking uh, uh, planning committee meeting, I would appreciate that. I'll just leave that as direction. I'm sure they can include some okay, form yeah. of an update there. Staff's already acknowledging that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I believe I had Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you. So through you, Mr. Deputy On this Mayor. motion. You're, you're speaking to the motion. It's on the I am floor. speaking to the motion, yes. So through you, Mr. Mayor, I have great difficulty equating uh, a comment at a planning meeting where we're talking about a building that was not going to have enough parking and an answer that would have led you to believe that there was adequate parking in Dundas for the downtown core. Um, and the fact that up until uh, the last increase, Dundas was paying 35 cents more per hour by thinking that it's okay to send some people off because I believe that the BIA has been more than the last 30 years. And not to say that the, the town and now the city isn't doing that at $10 and include Dundas in it. And you know, that may or may not matter. Day. And they are very clearly worried about it. You know, the, the businesses in downtown Dundas are small operators. They have people who drive to work and need to park. And um, so I have to support the BIA in this and my community. So thank you. I appreciate you, you listening to me. And I appreciate your consideration of my request. And I guess we'll wait and see how the vote goes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have no other speakers. Sorry, Councillor Pearson, and then Councillor Connolly. No, no. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I certainly appreciate the former speaker. I just, a couple of questions for you, Mr. Chairman, to Marty, and I don't know that it can be answered today. I'm supportive of the council's concerns from Dundas on the understanding that we get more information. I think the 35 cent increase was at the meters, and that was a direction that came out of Dundas, not this term, it was obviously last term, or maybe even earlier. Through you, Mr. Chairman, do you recall that, Marty? The chair, I, I that before amalgamation, Dundas had a parking operator. They had different rates than Hamilton, and we. And the former represent increase about so ago. Leave it at that. I'm not trying to create argument. I think we need information at the table, and I'm not sure how many lots I would appreciate knowing how many lots are in Dundas, and maybe some historical facts on how the arrangement is made. We lease the land, etc because I think that's at the table. I don't have a problem supporting the request today, but I want to be sure that when we do review this again, because it will come back, or maybe also suggest that it does come back in a timely manner, that we look at it maybe next year or wherever, that we have that information before us. If I could ask for that to be added, Mr. Chairman, I'd appreciate it. I see staff acknowledge that. So on the floor for... actually have have approved yet so and then uh, councillor jackson his amendment so councillor collins we're if we have a monopoly situation in dundas and there are no other comparators then on a go for basis i have no problem you know looking at the, uh, the freeze there but if we if there are private operators in dundas that have rates that are much higher than ours, then we need to be competitive. So I need that information to come back at some point in time. Uh, if it's a monopoly situation for and there's reluctance to delay that, but it's about parity with the private sector and being competitive. And I think the motion, the spirit of the motion, seeks to address that. Okay, so uh, staff uh, understand the further to the directions that are, and Councillor uh, Vanderbri, uh, Councillor uh, Collins asking for uh, a look at Dundas. I think Councillor Pierce's request. No, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not. For the other, I think there, there's merit to that. bring the additional information. One, I think there was an understanding on the one lot issue. Uh, additional information, in fairness to everybody here, in terms of Dundas, and if it's if it's true. on concession, which is before us, concession and Dundas, A and B. We will have an opportunity on the amendment if we want to park. Some cactus festivals that I'm aware of, and I don't know if private people take advantage and park, do parking during those festivals. That 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 is a factor, but there's other factors. I would like to defer Dundas, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. I was there at the debate in planning. There were references made to parking by the executive of the BIA. I already have it in my office. And and the and the successful business in Dundas. Something delicate. And and it doesn't matter what may be relevant. I don't recall exactly. Friday is all it needs uh, for me to. Uh, so right now uh, we have A and B. Uh, we can deal with it. Go ahead. I mean, that if we're going to go down the road by creating policy based on the fact that anywhere there is a competitive aspect between the private sector and ourselves, that we would increase the parking rates accordingly, then. parking lots down there so we can't as, as, as uh, an industry. what I can say is I'm not sure what Ottawa's understand what their official position is and with that I'm going to 
With all due respect, if you have issues with your your um, wards, then bring it back later if, you, if, if that's what you want to do. But we've got a motion on the floor for a concession for a reasonable uh, justification, and we have a motion on the floor for Dundas for this same thing, a reasonable justification. Both the area councillors, as I wish you would do for me when I come forward with certain er things, if you want to defer the rest of it to uh, the BIAs, hallelujah. Then, then refer the rest of it. But there's the motions on the floor right now. Uh, amendment on the floor uh, by Councillor Jackson. Does anyone wish to speak to that amendment? Yes, I want to support it, but I want to now piggyback on that and include Ottawa Street and Kenilworth uh, accordingly. Okay. Um, is that a friendly amendment? So we'll have to come back to you, Councillor Murla. So at this point, Councillor Jackson, uh, I'm going to test the will of, of uh, committee on the amendment for the time being, Concession Street. All those in favor? Carry. Any opposed? Okay. On item t uh, B, exempt Dundas for the time being. Uh, well, staff will come back with that information anyway, but for the time, that's what I said, time for the time being. All those in favor? Any so, yes, sir. So, so I'm in favor, and this is subject. We ratified this. We ratified with the budget back in March. That's right. We have more than just it. It's not the parking office. It looks after parking city wide. We already have the award fee that affects the bottom. Research to do, and I, I'll reserve my right to comment after watching some of the conversations we had with the executive director of the BIA there in Dundas and before we ratify the budget March 9th. But I will accept and, and uh, vote in favor of what's here today. Okay, uh, and we still have an opportunity on the main motion as amended to either deal with it today or we can refer to that. So just to, to provide some guidance. So at the, on, on this amendment, any other speakers? On Dundas. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Okay, so another amendment in regards to Kenworth and Auto Street to exempt like uptake numbers, waitlists, what sort of revenue we're receiving from Dundas, are there waiting lists, is there uptake? But now, absolutely, I'll be supportive. What okay. reserving the right to flip. Okay. Uh, Kenworth and Auto Street. Any other amendments? Just a question on the main motion. of the $760,000. Can you please? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in terms of uh, the parking reserve, the amendment in terms of the referred item number four does not uh, affect the balance or status of the parking reserve. Uh, the staff's response was, as it relates to the parking reserves, staff are asking for opportunity in terms of service. These revenues go to the reserves for the purpose of future service improvements, that would affect the mayor. First off, I, I believe the response from staff was the amount was 260000 but there was $61,000 uh, of, um, of an impacted department. So recognizing and or the direction was to report back Utilization of technology that that would form part of the report. The budget won't and not. We're going to approve the budget in a couple of weeks. And sixty thousand. So you don't have shortfalls. Future revenues. Hundred and sixty thousand dollars. That's what.
with no offsetting revenue, even though create new revenue of that two hundred dollars. Thank you, Councillor Collins. I want to be clear, just on the last statement, the revenue sources are completely different in terms of the issue we dealt with was a funding shortfall. So we've had what I, I don't like to use the term, but they were phantom revenues. We've incorporated revenues into the budget that we weren't realizing. So that, that's the first issue. The second one is we're talking about monthly permit holders. And so I'd, I'd, I'd like to know if, and I know it's probably a best guess whether or not through you to Marty, we have any idea in terms of how the 190 net revenue, the 190 in new revenues would be affected by excluding areas that essentially probably don't have a lot of monthly pass holders. Well, through Mr. Deputy Mayor, both uh, Dundas and Concession have monthly permit holders. So how would the how would the 190 be affected? Not in that they're not in the numbers we see in the core of the city, which is the central business. So Concession Street has one lot, very small numbers, but an insignificant amount. Dundas has uh, 12,420 in monthly permits, for the reflecting the. 250,000 revenue, 12,000 would come from Dundas. And again, Marty, real quick. So the estimated 251,000 in new revenues, 12,420 of that would come from Dundas monthly parkers. 12,000 a year? Right. Okay. So we're down. 190 to 70 range, okay. All right. Okay. So we have no other speakers. We have the main motion as amended. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Ferguson opposed. Okay. Now we're on 6.3 special events report. Or sorry, 6.2. Sorry, Councillor, did you? Have, no, we did that. It was amendment. Yeah. We already that, dealt with that. So we're on 6.2 licensing. Have staff who have paid parking entitlement. You have to net off sixty-one thousand from the two hundred and fifty division revenues. Moved by Councillor Marula, second by Councillor Jackson. To receive. To most I think Councillor Johnson wants to second that, and I'll explain that if I can. This is where we uh, the uh, health department wants to take the. Uh, an increase of 400%. And this impacts significant impact on them. A lot of pushback on, on putting through. It only has a pressure of 39,000. We add that to the level as an increase. Hey, Councillor Jackson, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I just want to make sure that this will, if this will not anymore. Johnson. Yeah, I fully support this. Um, we're looking at a lot of volunteer events, and uh, I know for a fact, and working with the Peach Festival and working with the, the Bimbrook Fair, the staff are there for, for about four, five, six hours, depending on. And when you add up the bill at the end of the day, it's like each staff member is getting 4000 or $3,000 a piece. And to me, this is just astronomical for, for volunteer. Um, it was a highlight of the conversation at the volunteer uh, meeting at the Winona Peach Festival. 30 organizations run out of the Peach Festival. They're all volunteers. They've been doing this, this job for a significant amount of time. So when staff come on board, and, I, and I'm sure they would, they would admit that it's, it's some of the, the issues they find are, are minor in nature in a lot of the cases because these volunteers have been doing the same job for the last 10 or two decades. So I totally um, support this, and uh, I just don't want to see the, the, the volunteers getting kicked um, wallet and if and if we do in the wallet and if we do put this on them then it does reflect the the grants that they come forward and asking for because they'll have to increase their grant ask to pay for the for the city services so I'm a hundred percent behind this and I hope my colleagues follow suit thank you 
Any further speakers to this? Councillor Dufar and then Councillor Person. I uh, wonder if we could entertain a retroactive if we're going to pass this here today. Um, I, I had a Living Rock actually reach out to me, same as uh, other institutions reached out to other councillors about this issue about a month or so ago. Of course, their event is today, so they wouldn't be eligible. Um, and through you to Mike Zagarek, is it possible if we pass this here today? to accommodate them in some sort of retro I'm able to take advantage Very good. sorry Stephanie to stop before Council Marula seconds at this in the 2015 uh, our mandates clear that we still have to do inspections of these high-risk food premises at these places so um, regardless of the funding or the sustainability of the funding uh, to pay for these uh, types of inspections, we're going to still go out there. So, you know, um, I'm hopeful that, you know, Council, in its wisdom, doesn't create a budget pressure for us, even though this is a user fee that was approved already by Council uh, back in December. Okay, Councillor Ferguson. Oh, I, I just want to confirm that I think the Living Rock will be charge that amount because it was approved effective January 1st, 2016. So there may be a rebate to, to Living Rock on this. And, and I'd be happy to amend the motion that effective January 1st, 2016, it, it is, um, we hold the fees to $35 per vendor. What? Mike, sorry. So through uh, you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, in terms of the revised fee, if uh, committee approves a revised fee for effective January 1st of 2016 to be that of the 2015 rate, we can work with public health to try to identify those who were affected to date on the, on the uh, previously amended fee in an effort to provide them the credit. So again, the 2016 rate should be the same as the 2000, previous 2015. So that would be the revision we would make when we bring forward the user fee by law in June. Okay, so currently uh, we just have the report that's to receive. There's no motion other than that. Well, but you can't speak to it and then put it on the floor. So your motion again, Councillor Ferguson? At for 2016, we uh, continue to charge $35 per vendor for festivals and events. Second by Councilor Ferguson. January 1st. Ferguson, all those in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Carried. Okay, thank you. Councilor, Mr. Mayor is opposed. We're at uh, motions. Yep, got one here. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Marula, and the uh, motions before you. And it really relates to uh, we, we made a commitment last year for a million dollars worth of funding. Do you have an issue? You've missed 9.1 to 9.3. We're at 7. We're 7. I'm so sorry. I am tired now. Go ahead. Well, this relates to the, uh, the arts funding that we made a commitment to uh, last year. And I, what I didn't realize is that each and every year we have to approve. And I, I don't think it's fair to the arts community. I think we made the overall commitment. So this is really uh, to kind of uh, pre-commit to uh, 2017 as well. That's the, that's the essence of the motion. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to keep them in limbo. We, uh, we made the commitment and it was clear. And uh, I just want to make sure that we cement that for next year so they don't have to be worried about uh, the next year's funding. Move well, by myself, signed by Councilor Marula. So can I take the, to pass the chair to Councilor Pearson? Boy, I, I guess my only issue, and I, I understand the commitment, but if uh, uh, the, the, the house caves in in regards to uh, revenues and, and, and taxes and, and so forth, and we're in a precarious position to make a decision, we're presupposing a decision prior to having that information. And I guess that's, I guess, I, I mean, that we might as well pass a lot of other we made and then we, we, we can shorten the process. So I'm, I'm effectively approving a 2017 item in the sense of what we're facing and the monies and proving them now in the 2016 budget process uh, is putting the, the horse the, the the cart before the horse and is really outside of all the pressures that we may need to understand and appreciate at the time and if this is the way we do business now and I you know certainly a, 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 an approach 
then I would suggest that we get Mike Zagarek to go through all the list of commitments and, and so forth, and we pre-prove all those uh, 2017 items. Uh, therefore, we can shorten the 2017 process. And I don't think that's something that you're going to get a lot of support on. So for those reasons, I think it's a bit difficult to be approving an actual number today, even though we agree in the principle, uh, for, uh, for next year. Anyway, those are my comments. Councillor, I have, um, assuming Council Mayor, you were the mover, so I'm not sure if you spoke to it. No, I just, uh, I just I, I outlined the motion, so if I could speak to that then. So, you know, based on kind of the comments we just heard, I mean, I, I, we were all in the room at the time, and I think we all understood that we made a three-year commitment. Um, uh, you know, the arts community believed that uh, they, they got a three-year commitment. All I'm suggesting by this, and I'm not going to get too deeply into this, is let's let's cement that three-year commitment now so that uh, they don't have to worry about it for next year. Uh, and, and that was my understanding when we did it, quite frankly. I, I thought that's the process we were on. Uh, unfortunately, it came up in the budget process this year as, a, as an item that needed to be dealt with this year and next year. Uh, I don't think that's fair to the arts community. I think we all agree that uh, we were going to match the funding, including the, the funding that the Community Foundation provided, which is actually tied to the funding that we're going to provide. So it's, a, it's an escalating scale, and we're on the same path, and I think it's not, not, not going to be our current practice to approve everything in advance, although I support multi-year budgeting, quite frankly. But having said that, this is a one-off that, uh, that doesn't need that kind of comment, to be honest. Okay, so I'll take the chair back. No other speakers? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, we're, um, that's the motion. So now we're at notice of motions. Any, sorry, Michael? But Mike, can you tell just that we pre-approve uh, before we even have a choice? Well, okay. I thought that's what he was going to address. No. So, so through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm sorry, I need to take committee back to point three because what in a motion by Councillor Ferguson was a specific value, the $35, and that's not the current fee because there's an HST uh, impact on it. So, so I would ask committee just to simply revise the 2016 rate to the 2015 rate and avoid, I'm okay with that. avoid the confusion. The okay. other, and, and I just want to confirm in terms of what was assumed in the 2016 budget for public health was the revenue, the 30... $9,200, and we would need an amendment to the 2016 levy to reflect an additional $39,200 levy impact. I thought I did that in my motion, okay. that it goes on the levy. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so the taxpayers will pick up the, uh, the bill. Uh, now, we have the, uh, we have the motion, uh, we have to reconsider the original position, Madam Clerk. Through Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, the way I actually had it written was that the um, inspection fee for uh, remain at the 2015 approved rate. I didn't put the dollar amount oh, in. Oh, good, perfect. So we're okay. Perfect. You're ahead of the game. See, you're you're on. You're on. So, so the, I'm correct though. We're, at, we're 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 going to take those additional costs and put it on the back, uh, levy. No, I support it. I support it. So we're um, 9.1. 9.1. May I have a motion to receive items 9.1 to 9.3? Moved and second. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried. We're in item 10. 10.1 private confidential recommendation B to non union management and exempt. Group compensation. Members of the committee, you have before you a private confidential item 10.1. I understand that Councillor Ferguson has a motion that can be addressed in the open session. Yes, it can. So it's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Maria Pearson, that the matter respecting private confidential recommendation B to the non union management exempt group compensation be referred back to the non union subcommittee for further information and discussion. Staff have some new information. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Councillor Ferguson did the introduction, so we are. We don't need to move into closed closed session, so we look for a motion to adjourn, right? Moved by Councillor Parcher, second by Councillor Pearson. All those in favor? All those opposed? Carried.